morning, Dr. Patil. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, uh, all. Good afternoon and good evening to our international participants. Uh, thank you all for participating. We are really looking forward to having a day that is going to offer you hear about application of flow cytometry in health sciences from domain experts as well as tutorials from the expert flow cytometry users. And most importantly, uh, you will be able to clarify your doubts uh, with the speakers. So uh, the YouTube user, you can type your doubt in the comment section and for WebEx user, you can write down in the chat box. We, uh, we are really excited about the range of participants who have shown interest in this workshop. Uh, we have participants from across the country and we have also wonderful people who have joined from 10 different countries. Uh, we hope that you will enjoy the workshop. Uh, so we like to get started and I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Jesus Deva, uh, who is uh, the director of ICMR NIRRS. So uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Sajdeva. Uh, uh, and uh, Madam, uh, I, will, I will give a brief introduction about MAM, then uh, we can inaugurate our session with uh, Madam and uh, uh, Professor Arora. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Gitanjali Sajdeva, uh, Director of our Institute, ICMR National Institute for Research in Reproductive Health, Mumbai. He's also head of Department of Cell Physiology and Pathology. Dr. Sajdeva did a PhD from Jalan Nehru University, India, and work as a uh, long-term overseas associate at National Institute of Health, USA. Her uh, research group is interested in understanding the mechanisms and molecular determinants of endometrial receptivity, implantation, and endometriosis. Uh, Dr. Sajdeva is a recipient of Young Scientist Award from the uh, Indian Society of Human Genetics, Royal International Research Award from the Royal International Twin Congress, and awarded GP Talwar Mid Level Career Award by Indian Society for the Study in Reproduction and Fertility, and has uh, 60 publications in a uh, reputed journal. Mum, uh, please take over this issue. Uh, thank you, Dimpu, for introducing me. And very good morning, all of you. And on behalf of the National Institute for Research and Reproductive Health, Mumbai, I welcome you all to this online workshop on uh, application of flow cytometry in health sciences, organized by uh, Dr. Dimpu and Dr. Venav Patel in association with the Cytometry Society India and uh, Sun Pharma Research Foundation or Science Foundation. And I've been told that in response to the call for participation for this workshop, there were 1800 plus registration or applications. So this is a huge response and uh, this shows that uh, there is a growing interest in this uh, tool, flow cytometry, and probably the scope of this uh, tool is also expanding. Um, I can't think of any other technique except flow cytometry where you can have data from multiple parameters in a single cell at cellular level. So it has wide range of application. You may be knowing that uh, besides like the most conventional one is like uh, as, uh, detecting cell surface antigen or detecting intracellular an antigen. And I can see from the agenda that both these exercises are there in the tutorial. And um, in addition to conventional like techniques like immunophenotyping, cell cycle analysis, viability, apoptosis, oncosis, necroptosis, and many functional assays like iron, uh, iron flux and uh, cell proliferation and estimation of rare events. I mean, it, flow cytometry offers a whole range of uh, applications which are very useful in health sciences, biomedical research, and even in clinical settings. And I've been told that uh, earlier we used to think that the major focus is always on protein, but now there are applications where you can merge RNA as well as protein in a given set of cells. So this has uh, kind of a lot of application or I say potential, especially in tumor cell biology. 
and I was reading somewhere that uh, in contrast to what we do normally in vitro flow cytometry, now there are developments in the area of in vivo flow cytometry also. So that the field is vast, it has, I mean, whole gamut of applications. But today's workshop, I think, would be a kind of primer, a good primer for all those who are beginning, who want to learn about the basics of flow cytometry. And I can see from the agenda that our faculty is expert. They are well-known names in the field. And I'm very sure that all the participants will really enjoy this workshop. And I wish all of you a very good day ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now, I would like to uh, introduce a prof Professor S.K. Aurora, who is the outgoing president of uh, PCS. And, uh, Sir has really ignited this uh, entire process. It is um, possible to have this workshop because of uh, sir, uh, Sir's involvement and igniting the entire process. Uh, well, uh, Professor Sunil Kumar Arora is a uh, HOD of Department of Translation and Re Regenerative Medicine, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, PGIMER Chandigarh. He is also a member of National Academy of Medical Science, President of Indian Immunology Society, and President of Federation of Immunological Societies of Asia Oceania, PIMSA. Pro Professor Arora obtained his PhD from PGMER Chandigarh uh, and did his PDF from University, University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, USA. His research interests are in the field of immunology of infectious diseases such as HIV, SCV, TB, and mismaniasis, cancer stem cells, and mesenchymal stem cells. <clears throat> Professor Arora is a recipient of uh, Indo-US UNAID DBT Young Investigator Award, Fogarty Fellowship, and Senior Scientist Origin Award in Immunology, and has uh, over 170 publications. Sir, please. Uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dimpu, for this kind introduction. Uh, Dr. Gitanjali Sachdeva, ma'am, Dr. Bainav, Dr. Dimpu, Dr. Ritu Gupta, our incoming president of Cytometry Society, and all my friends, all invited faculty, faculty from uh, scientists from Sun Pharma Science Foundation, and all participants. It's really nice to know that uh, the Cytometry Society is associating with the Sun Pharma Foundation to conduct this workshop. As Madam has already said, that cytometry is a rapidly growing powerful technique used in basic as well as clinical research, as well as in the diagnostic laboratories. So its major role has come up in the diagnostic laboratories and monitoring of, you know, uh, cancers, uh, the lymphomas, leukemias, and uh, their typing. And there are so many applications which have come up. So flow cytometry uh, really has become a very, very versatile tool in the uh, hands of uh, scientists as well as clinicians uh, in the day-to-day -day practice. Cytometry offers great opportunities to the scientists in translational and applied research and provides diagnostic and therapeutic tools to the clinicians. The flow cytometry was uh, mainly popularized in India through uh, efforts of uh, one stalwart, I will take the name, uh, which is uh, Professor Avtar Krishan, who is in uh, University of Miami uh, in USA. You know, way back in 2002, he, he visited India and he was sitting in the office of Dr. R.C. Sorti, who was vice chancellor uh, of the Punjab University. But at that time, he was just uh, head of biotechnology. And uh, uh, we had one very dynamic, uh, you know, uh, scientist from India, Dr. Arvinder Singh, who, uh, who, was, uh, who did his PhD from MTech Chandigarh. These three of them, they were sitting and chatting because Arvinder Singh was associated with BD at that time, Bacton Dickinson. They, uh, you know, thought that let us start uh, Indo-US workshops. So they, 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 the first workshop was held in Chandigarh. 
uh, in uh, Punjab University, and uh, I happened to be associated with that because uh, we had the first flow cytometer uh, in uh, Chandigarh in our lab only. That was fax scan. You know, we later on purchased it, uh, fax caliber, and there was another fax star which came in experimental medicine under Dr. Uh, Nirmal Gangli in the experimental medicine. So uh, we all got together. We we uh, conducted this first workshop, uh, which was five days workshop. So then it started like that, and uh, every year uh, Dr. Avtar Krishan will bring in. Uh, many, uh, you know, senior flow cytometrist experts from abroad and uh, some of, uh, you know, from India, they will join. And uh, we used to conduct the flow cytometry workshops, which were called Indo-US uh, flow cytometry workshops. And it has been, uh, I think, 22 years now that, that uh, they, they have been conducted. 22nd workshop will be held this year, uh, virtually now. So, those were the days when uh, when the flow cytometry took off. You know, there were uh, numbered people on those days uh, who used to use uh, flow cytometry. So, uh, till th 2005, the flow cytometry was still in fancy in India and infrequent attempts uh, to promote, organize uh, these training and uh, these uh, knowledge dissemination were being done. So there was, there was a great uh, need for the professionals in the field to join hands and form common platform, uh, which would facilitate fulfillment of uh, their objectives. And uh, uh, the flow cytometrists in India, they thought that uh, why not to start our own society? So the few people, one, uh, you know, there was a dynamic uh, person who is still associated with uh, Becton Dickinson, Dr. Paresh Jain. So he took the lead, you know, he, he contacted many people and Dr. Gopal Pandey gave him the lead and uh, the, the Cytometry Society took birth in 2005 in CCMB with its uh, you know, headquarter, which is still in CCMB Hyderabad. Dr. Gopal Pandey was there in those days. And then I, I know I was also founder member uh, of this society. Then we had, uh, you know, uh, many, many uh, these uh, flow cytometry from uh, Tata Memorial Hospital, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, you know, Sumit Gujral, Dr. Ch Shubda Chiplankar, uh, then Dr. Madhkaikar, you know, from uh, uh, NI, uh, this Mumbai, and uh, Dr. Metali Chatterjee. So we all got together and we formed a very small society at that time. But then this society has really grown up. You know, you will be amazed to know that the membership has grown to uh, more than 875 uh, this, uh, you know, season when we held the first virtual conference and workshop only, which finished on 30th. And uh, uh, it was uh, a great attempt on part of all the participants, all, all the faculty and, uh, you know, coordinators of workshop, because that was first time the workshop on flow cytometry was held virtually. And uh, the, the, the uh, we, we developed a module where where the scientists they conducted the experiment, videographed it, and the videos were played. And it is it was as good as uh, you know live workshop. You know we have been holding these workshops uh, since 2005 independently. Also earlier we used to conduct in uh, association with Indo-US you know faculty. But then slowly slowly the cytometry society matured. We, we had the growing number of flow cytometrists. They became experts. They started conducting workshops. So we, the Cytometry Society conducted many workshops uh, all around uh, India. You know, Dr. Ritu Gupta conducted many workshops in Ames, Dr. Manisha Mankaikar in Bombay, Chiplankar, Dr. Chiplankar in Ektrak, Bombay. Similarly in TMH, you know, Dr. Smith Pudral. Dr. Subramaniam and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, Kunal and uh, Prashant So, uh, so the society has really grown very hard, uh, large now. And I'm very happy that Sun Pharma came forward to associate with the Cytometry Society to conduct this workshop. So it's very gratifying to find Dr. Vanna Patel and Dimpu Gogai from TCS side took the responsibility 
to organize this workshop in association with Sun Pharma. They have put together a very, very robust program. And uh, I'm sure all the participants, so overwhelming response. I'm very happy that more than 1800 registrations, it's amazing. So I congratulate Dr. Vanov and Dimpu for uh, making these efforts as well as Sun Pharma. You know, Sun Pharma uh, has come out really uh, good and it's a new trend starting that we hold association uh, workshops uh, with TCS. So I'm sure participants are going to enjoy uh, full day deliberations and demonstrations, which are uh, to be conducted by uh, various experts all through day. I wish you all the best. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bainav, for inviting me to say a few words, and uh, Dimpu also for making efforts to organize this on behalf of Cytometry Society. All the best, Jai Hind. God bless you all. Thank you very much, sir, for taking us back to the history of TCS. It, 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 it was uh, very informative, sir. Thank you very much. Now we uh, begin the session. Uh, the moderator for this session is Dr. Venop Patel, who is also the course coordinator of today's workshop. Dr. Venop Patel is uh, head of uh, Department of Viral Immunopathogenesis. Dr. Patel obtained his PhD from Cancer Research Institute, presently known as ACTRAC and then went to NIH uh, to do his PDF, returning to join ICMR NIRH uh, with a Ramalinga Swami Fellowship. Uh, <clears throat> his research interests are in deciphering host and pathogen signatures associated with chronic viral infections such as HIV, CAV, and now SARS-CoV-2. He also has an additional responsibility of serving as nodal officer of COVID-19 team of the Institute uh, Dr. Patel has authored 40 plus publications in reputed scientific journals and have uh, active international grants from NIH and DBT Welcome Trust. Also, I take this opportunity to thank, it, uh, to thank him for uh, giving me the opportunity to organize this workshop and for his continued, uh, continued support throughout the process. Dr. Uh, Patel, please take over the platform. Thank you, Dimpu. Uh, it was a very kind and totally unnecessary introduction, but thank you. In, in, in any case, I would like to uh, quickly reaffirm our appreciation of support uh, for uh, Dr. Kitanjali, uh, our director, uh, Professor Aurora from TCS, and Sun Pharma uh, for their uh, uh, partnership in organizing this workshop. So, uh, moving ahead, uh, the first session uh, that we have uh, coordinated is uh, dealing with the basics of flow cytometry as one would expect the uh, uh, domain expert and the tutorial that we have lined up will take you through uh, the essential aspects dealing with the setting up of a flow cytometry experiment uh, as well as uh, followed by a talk uh, we will have a, uh, you know, a tutorial uh, that will uh, talk to you and and show you uh, how we would do a basic immunophenotyping uh, experiment, uh, specifically, which is going to be CD4, CD8, uh, absolute T-cell counting. Uh, so without uh, wasting any further time, I will quickly introduce our first uh, domain expert, Dr. Rishikesh Patil. Uh, so Dr. Patil, it's a great pleasure to have you here and thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, so keeping with, uh, you know, moving with demographics and the and 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 keeping it fresh uh, we have invited dr patel as a relatively younger fresh uh, face in the field of of uh, uh, flow cytometry as well as uh, uh, also departing from the norm we believe uh, his expertise uh, especially being in the private sector uh, would add to uh, the learnings from uh, uh, this particular talk so dr patel uh, did his phd from actrac and he worked uh, for Acutest Biologics Private Limited as a research scientist in 2016 and was also an Inspire faculty at ACTREC in 2020. He is currently involved in the strategic planning and execution of, for optimization of CAR T cells, uh, the manufacturing unit at uh, ACTREC. Uh, I'm sorry, for uh, uh, his uh, organization. Dr. Patel is a recipient of GP Talwar Young Scientist Award from the Indian Immunological Society and served as an ambassador for Immunopedia for the Asia region. During his academic year, uh, he has contributed uh, five papers in reputed journals. So, uh, Dr. Patel, uh, also, I would request personally, if it is possible in the time that you have, to briefly tell us about what your experience was when you transitioned 
uh, from the so-called research to the uh, uh, private sector and how flow cytometry changed, if at all it did, when you uh, did this. So welcome and uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. And your presentation, if you can put uh, into the slide view, please. Okay. So it is also visible, right? Yes. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah. I yeah, great. yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, organizers, for this, uh, uh, for inviting me for this wonderful uh, workshop today. I especially thank uh, Limpu Gogai for uh, inviting me for this lecture. Um, as uh, as Dr. Vaino asked me to speak about my transition and with respect to flow cytometry, I would like to take a few minutes here. So um, I was uh, part of Indo-US flow cytometry workshop conducted at ACTRAC and they were, there I was um, uh, faculty members to take uh, tutorials for the participants and it was a wonderful uh, teaching experience for me personally to, to uh, learn the flow cytometer instruments and its concept that time from the uh, faculty which came from uh, us uh, so that from that learning phase now i am in uh, immunal therapeutics uh, working in the process development and uh, manufacturing. So here uh, we are in particles manufacturing and definitely I can tell you the flow cytometer has uh, absolutely... Uh, Dr. Patil, yeah? uh, this is Professor Chauhan. Can you get yeah. closer to the source of your mic a little bit? Sometimes okay. Yeah. Your voice is trailing off. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is it better now? First class. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, um, yes, I was talking about flow cytometers in uh, CAR T cells. So, I, I did my PhD in uh, immunology and now I am in the applications of uh, uh, immunology, that is, immunotherapy to manufacturing CAR T cells. And flow cytometer has substantial role there. So, from um, uh, working on CAR T cells, whether at RD level to the process development, how the CAR T cells are behaved. Even the uh, manufactured CAR T cells are analyzed in the QC uh, through flow cytometers only, the CAR expression, and even the release criteria, uh, the potency assays of CAR T cells, uh, whether they are actually cytotoxic to against the B cells. So that is even uh, flow, uh, analyzed by the flow cytometry. So it is uh, um, very important, uh, not only in the research, but at the industrial scale, the flow cytometers are very, very important. So, um, moving ahead, so at, as it was um, uh, invented in late 1960s um, as, a, as a technology to uh, analyze uh, DNA content of the cells, but later on, now we can understand that it is every alternate uh, immunology related paper has flow cytometry data and not only in the research as i tell in the industry in the diagnostic sector also um, the hematological malignancies or hematological any diseases immunodeficiency diseases um, uh, they have even the hiv related diagnostics also require flow cytometry and it has been proven that it has substantial role so this is a very interesting uh, technology rather i will say uh, to understand and uh, utilize to understand more the biology. Um, and so this is my disclaimer that whatever presentation, uh, uh, the information in the presentation is taken from the open source and the opinion express are uh, personal. So to begin with, uh, what is flow cytometry especially? It is the uh, uh, measurement of characteristics of cells at single cell level at a rapid rate so there is a uh, importance to these two words that is single cell and rapid rate because uh, single cell level, uh, analysis similar to flow cytometry is possible by microscopy but the rate is very slow so and the advantage with flow cytometry it can give a statistical significance data um, 
that is why it is at the rapid rate and the importance is so the cells are in the flow uh, the the cyto transfer cells they are in the flow and they are uh, measured that is the metric so that's why the term can be uh, called as flow cytometry uh, it is really a rapid uh, rate it's 100 uh, cells per second to 1 lakh cells per second can be a rate of a flow cytometer uh, to characterize the cells so how how actually a flow cytometer works i will just uh, what the, this presentation i have uh, uh, classified uh, or into two parts the first is instrumentation followed by uh, actual experiment uh, and in the experiment design i have focused on uh, uh, this panel designing part so first i will uh, uh, give you overall uh, look of uh, what the instrumentation is so it consists of uh, three compartments rather uh, fluidic system optic system and uh, electronic system so the cells uh, as, I, as I said that uh, the cells are analyzed or measured, uh, the characteristics of cells are measured when they are in a flow. So the, uh, the role of what a fluidic system plays is to keep the cells in a flow, but uh, and at the same time it has to be measured at a single cell level. So one cell should be separate from another. So this the single stream of uh, the cells is uh, possible by the fluidic system which is under pressure uh, these uh, cells then interact with the light source so light source here is a laser and the point at which they interact is the interrogation point where the light uh, the incident light then reflects and that reflected light further passes through multiple mirrors and filters and that reflected light is captured by the detectors the uh, this light is then converted to the electronic signal and that then that is the that uh, analyze so flow cytometer as an instrument in a, per, uh, in a typical engineering sense it's a uh, instrument measuring converting the uh, characteristics in terms of light into the uh, electronic system which can be uh, analyzed further so uh, fluidic system uh, it consists of highly pressurized system. It's a line diagram. Uh, I'm not going to go in much detail about it, but I will just uh, talk about how the fluidics works. So this is a sample where a cell suspension is present. So this is a tube containing cell suspension. And from this tube, it's a narrow tube, the cells are passed into a, a part of a flow cytometer called as flow cell. Uh, this uh, tube containing the sample is pressurized and at the same time there is another um, liquid called as sheet fluid uh, it is also a pressurized container and that sheet fluid also uh, then passes through this flow cells so this special type of arrangement is made called as hydrodynamic focusing so this uh, is happening to make the cells into a single stream so that a single cell can uh, hit or come to an interrogation point where it can hit the laser so the sheath uh, uh, the, these two streams are uh, pressurized liquid so uh, the sheath pressure is always the uh, lesser than the sample pressure so because of this higher sample pressure the cells which are coming in uh, forms a linear rather a stream what is called in this uh, flow cytometry term it, it, they form a stream one after another so that a single cell can pass through and pass through an interrogation point where the uh, analysis uh, the, the rather incident light will hit the cells and the uh, reflected light will further analyze so uh, it takes place so this is a beautiful arrangement to make the cells in a flow the next uh, uh, compartment is the optics system so we will talk about laser that is the light source so why lasers are used in uh, flow cytometry because we have to analyze the cells at a single cell level so that the uh, the light source should not have a broader area so uh, that means uh, it should be a monochromatic and coherent light so uh, 
provided by uh, the lasers. Uh, then the high photon density illuminate uh, the chloroform which we are, which will be uh, used to analyze and characterize the cells. And uh, because these laser lights have specific wavelengths and that is important for the excitement of the fluorochromes used so that we will see in the subsequent slide, slides what the fluorochromes are and how they are uh, illuminated rather so uh, the power of these um, lasers uh, that is also important to excite the fluorochromes uh, there is efficient energy transfer to the fluorochrome because of its uh, uh, laser light laser light uh, it is a stable and reliable signal and the most importantly it is a solid state continuous and having a small footprint so uh, that is why the importance of laser and there are different types of laser uh, the source of laser that is argon ion uh, krypton or helium ion uh, source so they having specific uh, wavelength so this is more important the wavelength of uh, laser Next is the optical uh, filters which are used in the uh, flow cytometer because we uh, have to specifically analyze the uh, fluorochromes and need to be uh, the light has to be filtered so that a specific wavelength can be analyzed and this is achieved by using three types of filters called as long pass filters, short pass filters and band pass filters. The meaning of this is the long pass filters means if you take an example of lp 500 so it will pass the light above the wavelength of 500 and below that it will get reflected so it's a selective uh, it, it allows selective waves to pass through and uh, the selective wavelength to reflect so this is very important another is uh, short pass uh, similar if you take the uh, sp500 so less than 500 uh, light uh, wavelength will get passed and above that will get reflected and the third is band pass so it has a range so 500 oblique 50 means it can allow the light of wavelength 500 plus 25 and 500 minus 25 to pass through and rest of the light is get uh, reflected so because of these properties the uh, this kind of arrangement is possible this these are the detectors this is specific octagonal detector in the bb type of machines and this is possible because of this kind of filter so this is the uh, after interrogation or after analysis the reflected light is passed uh, through this and, and for this detector this becomes an incident ray it first falls onto one type of um, detector and through these mirrors only a specific type of light is um, allowed through and rest of the light is reflected so then it it hits the another detector then likewise uh, this is the optimal utilization or conservation of energy till the last detector detects the uh, light so this arrangement is possible because of these filters so and because of these only we can detect the different uh, parameters of the cell. Uh, the last important part of the instrumentation is the electronic system. The, what detects the light are is the uh, detectors. So they are of two types that is PMT, photo uh, multiplier tubes or photodiodes. And the, the mechanism is that whatever light in terms of photons is incident on the photo detector those photons are converted into electrons and those electrons further amplified and converted into a digital signal which is then uh, read by the computer and we analyze the data. So uh, the PMTs are high, uh, uh, the sensitivity of the PMT towards the incident photons is very high. So for example, uh, for the dyes which are dimmed, uh, the uh, detectors are generally the PMTs and the photodiodes uh, can detect the strong signals. So the bright dyes generally um, have detectors of uh, photodiodes. So the combinations of these PMTs and photodiodes help to um, 
analyze the dim as well as the bright uh, fluorocons so that we will understand we'll see what is dim and bright in the subsequent slide uh, another point to uh, understand is the efficiency of these detectors so it is uh, designated or measured in terms of uh, q that is efficiency it is nothing but the uh, number of photo electrons generated by the uh, detector for uh, per number of fluorescence molecules it receives for example if it receives uh, this many uh, fluorescent molecule how many photo electrons it can convert into and further amplify so that is the efficiency so there are different types of pmts for example these uh, detectors having different um, efficiency higher uh, higher efficiency or lower efficiency and the these um, efficiency has an impact on the data so how it is then uh, there is another term that is relative efficiency means this uh, uh, pmts having lower relative efficiency produce higher cv of the data and that leads to lower resolution for example if you see this um, first plot histogram so this is from lower uh, efficiency of the detector the resolution is uh, compromised here but if the detector is having higher efficiency to uh, analyze the higher quantum yield of the fluorochrome then it gives a better resolution of the data so this is the importance of so uh, this is actually this is a part of instrumentation so as a user we may not have to worry much about but we should understand uh, the the science or behind it uh, next is uh, uh, what what a flow cytometer actually measures uh, it uh, rather what is the what data comes out of a flow cytometer it's a three types of data what we can see is the it measures the cell size it measures the cells granularity and it measures the characteristics of a cell in terms of fluorescence uh, what we actually prepare the cells uh, for so uh, when when the cell is passing through uh, uh, interrogation point so this is the incident uh, laser light so when it passes through uh, there is a shadow is forming to this side uh, and this is a determinant of shape uh, or rather size of the uh, of every cell so that is why uh, the size of the cell is uh, determined or this the detector for the size of the cell is present parallel to the uh, incident light so that is called as forward scatter but uh, at the same time the incident light reflects out because of the uh, uh, cellular components and that reflected light can actually go and can go in any direction but which reflects to the uh, uh, 90 degrees perpendicular to the incident rays uh, the detector uh, placed that area is called as side scatter and that measures the granularity because the uh, reflection of these um, light rays is because of how granular the cells are so that measures is the granularity of the cells because uh, in a in if i take an example of a pbmc so there are different types of cells having variety of granularity for example monocytes are less granular than the uh, granulocytes or neutrophils so based on these two parameters only we can differentiate these uh, the types of cells um, so that is another uh, parameter and third is uh, the fluorescence so whatever character the specific antibody tag fluorochromes are used to stain the cells uh, of a specific marker and based on that we analyze the cells so we'll talk about fluorescence in the further slide but overall uh, it measures the cell size the granularity and the fluorescence signals as part of measurement now how a signal is generated in in flow so as i told you the interrogation point is where the uh, laser light hits the cell so if you consider this as a uh, light path uh, then this is a cell uh, flowing through as part of a stream so when it hits the beam of light that is the incident light it starts generating a signal so when it is at the center of the beam of incident light it uh, it peaks up and uh, 
when it exits so overall this movement of a cell through the path of this beam it generates a gaussian distribution of the signal and that gaussian distribution will definitely have a height uh, when when it is plotted across time and uh, intensity then it it forms uh, the peak will have a height the peak will have a width which is uh, measured in terms of time and the height and width will calculate the area so area is the parameter which can calculate uh, consider height as well as the width so uh, for for parameters so uh, this uh, the para uh, the where can be measured by uh, the signal intensity is measured by height or area so area is generally used to measure the signal intensity or for any fluorochrome the point here is this what we saw for a single laser what happens for a uh, high end machines where the multiple fluorochromes are uh, multiple lasers are present so these lasers are separated out by distance or by uh, by time so uh, this this uh, the, the cell flowing through a stream so this is a flow cell yeah this whatever propagation happening is uh, the cells are passing through the flow cell and this uh, interaction with the individual laser takes place through the uh, separately by distance or through time the lasers are fired with uh, separated by time and the light generated is individually collected and then passed to to the detectors which we saw like a octagonal detector system uh, that's why it's a way to reduce uh, the uh, crossover of the signal um another important point to consider here is the signal to noise ratio uh, what is signal to noise ratio it's whenever we want to study any characteristics we want a clear signal we want to understand its uh, uh, that signal clearly because but but what happens there always comes a background because of certain factors so those factors can be electronic system uh, where the signal the 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 light energy converts into the electrons and then electron uh, the voltage is further amplified and the electronic signal is then analyzed by the computer so during that process because of physics uh, the electronic noise exists so but but that is at the base level so as a user we need not to worry about much about electronic system but the another uh, factor which determines the signal to noise ratio is nature of the sample so what contributes to that uh is either the uh, unbound antibody present in the uh, sample uh the spectral overlap of a cell uh, that contributes the uh, lack of uh, signal reduction in the sn2 ratio and then the scatter from the flow cell uh, raman scatter because it's a liquid and the light can in, uh, in light passing through the liquid reduce uh, uh, generate a raman uh, scatter and the cells own autofluorescence uh, so how to reduce this um, signal to noise ratio uh, rather how to reduce the noise as such uh, is to thorough washing of a cell during sample preparation so we have to uh, get rid of unbound uh, fluorochrome present in the sample so we have to give a proper washing of the cells after a staining then uh, appropriate compensation controls are required to reduce the spectral overlap then the sheath fluid should be clean uh, so that is another reason to uh, reduce the uh, noise uh, regular cleaning of the flow cell and fluidic system and the replacing any damaged optical components so this comes as a part of uh, regular wear and tear on regular care of uh, flow cytometer so this is also very important to reduce the noise uh, or background noise of the data we should have a clear clear data uh, this is just a representation of what data uh, generated by the flow cytometer that is forwards and side scatter so that i was telling that the cells can be differentiated based on the forward and side scatter uh, cell the different kinds of lymphocytes monocytes and granulocytes so granulocytes being more granular they are present at upper uh, right position of the side and forward scatter uh, the single 
color that, so these two plots are generated by the uh, fluorescent signal so uh, when a single parameter is analyzed it is analyzed by histogram and when the uh, two parameters are analyzed they are analyzed by the dot plot so uh, this is this is the basic uh, type of uh, plots generated by the uh, data out coming out of the flow cytometer so uh, there are certain software which can generally give a three dimensional uh, plots also but uh, that is software specific but not the flow cytometer specific and now i'm uh, coming to the important part of uh, panel design so why why uh, so much of concern with respect to panel designing is important so because uh, if you consider a difference in the single color staining so the cells is labeled with the antibody having a single color so it is very straightforward to analyze the presence or absence or the uh, quantitation of that single parameter on a cell but when we want to have more data of our cell or we want to classify the different types of cells then we have to uh, stain the cells or introduce multiple parameters during staining or and here is the uh, that parameters is in terms of presence of fluorochromes so this presence of fluorochromes can introduce uh, uh, introduce the the noise what we were talking so uh, so that is why understanding uh, this panel designing comes very important to resolve the presence of these different parameters in a single tube so that we can have a clear data and, and accordingly the interpretation will uh, matter so uh, while designing a flow cytometry experiment per se uh, especially a multicolor flow cytometer so ask certain types of questions because they are very important the first is which cell population is of interest for example if you are doing pbmcs so are you interested in regulatory tissues because the number of t regs is very low uh, then we have to understand the the biology uh, are you interested in the only t cells itself which are in abundance or the rare population for example nk nkt or gamma delta t cells so that determines the uh, analysis pattern as well as staining pattern uh, then how many cells are needed for carrying out the experiment as such because if we are interested in a rare population to and further characterize that rare population for example nk nkt or gamma delta then we should acquire more number of cells then so that, that then that uh, so that we will have a statistically significant data then for that purpose we should start uh, the experiment the flow cytometry flow cytometry experiment rather the staining with the higher number of cells so these questions this background uh, knowledge of is very important to design an experiment uh, then how many and what type of cell markers whether single or multiple uh, to be uh, identified so what what is your interest uh, in this? and that should be defined rather first before starting with the experiment then type of marker whether that uh, whatever you want to uh, study whether it is present on the surface of a cell present uh, intracellular intracellular can be in the cytoplasm or it can be uh, nuclear because the staining protocols will differ accordingly and that staining protocol has impact on the data so that is why this information is very important what we actually want to study for example secret if you want to study the cytokines secreting cells then the staining protocol is different we have to incubate the cells with the grafeldin or uh, something those which will inhibit the secretion and then then and then only we can analyze the cell then uh, the, this is important part the availability of antibody of interest tagged with fluorochrome of interest so um, the marker what we want and the uh, fluorochrome the combination whether that is available uh, with the vendor so that that background literature study should be there that is important and the effect of experimental condition on cell viability and expression pattern of marker because if you want to study the cells after pre treatment for example if you want to activate the cells and then study the activation markers or uh, want to study the cytokine pattern or if there is any differentiation 
then we have we should have a literature survey whether this experimental condition is regulating the expression pattern for example cytokines do have a kinetics so during that kinetics of secretion of the cytokines only we should uh, capture the cells do the staining and further analyze so this background information is important for you before starting the flow cytometry experiment uh, now the first step to set up the experiment is to know flow cytometer go to the flow cytometry facility discuss with the concerned person and understand the configuration of the uh, system for example this is an example of uh, five color instrument uh, present so first make such kind of a table what uh, how many colors are present which are the uh, how many lasers are there in the instrument available instrument in the institute or wherever it is uh, or in the lab what is the wavelength um, what are the filters uh, what are the mirrors what are the filters because these filters actually determine which fluorochromes we can select and write down this uh, corresponding uh, fluorochromes available uh, which can be detected through this kind of filters so for example uh, if you take uh, this 530 uh, 530 30 bandpass filter so through this 530 30 bandpass filter we can uh, determine the fitc and we have to consider the emission spectra we'll come to that uh, spectra part so but this background information the configuration of the flow cytometer should be in hand before start next is the selection of fluorochrome so uh, so this uh, this configuration of the flow cytometer give you the limits of how many uh, colors or how many multiple combination of parameters we can club together so if you if you consider for this example itself so this is five laser instrument then maximum uh, it can do is uh, this six plus three plus this three uh, uh, two and for uh, around 18 plus 2 18 fsc and ssc those 18 parameters we can analyze plus uh, fsc and ssc through this system so through this con configuration so uh, we can't do 25 parameter obviously so this background information is important um, among among these which to select so that we will uh, try to understand in the subsequent slides uh, we should under the excitation emission spectra of a fluorochrome so when we are uh, staining the cells with the fluorochrome tag antibody uh, each fluorochrome has uh, emission uh, excitation and emission spectra rather uh, a molecule called as fluorochrome which is getting excited rather it absorbs the energy uh, coming from incident light then it get excited and emit that energy in the form of light so that molecule is called as fluorochrome so uh, the emitted light will definitely have a lesser energy and higher wavelength so whatever fluorochrome we are uh, trying to incorporate in our multicolor flow cytometry we should be uh, we should have a ready uh, table of excitation and emission spectra of the fluorochrome now as i said the word spectra is the uh, means itself means that uh, fluorochrome has a range so if this is the emission spectra of fluorochrome say a so this is a spectra that means uh, at this wavelength this is emission wavelength it has maximum uh, quantum yield but at this wavelength it has lesser quantum yield but still it is emitting uh, the emission spectra that's why it is called a spectra it has a spread now it now if we want to do a multicolor experiment then definitely we will add more than one fluorochrome in a single tube then as it is a spectra there is a probability that the spectra will overlap of the two fluorochromes the this i'm talking with respect to emission spectra now because the flow cytometer will detect the emission spectra so uh, these are the two detectors one detector is for fluorochrome a and another detector is for fluorochrome b then what happens this spectra or the emitted light uh, is can also be detected in the uh, detector of fluorochrome b uh, the best example i can give is uh, fitc so the emission color uh, or the light by fitc is green 
but it's not always green green is it, it is the color is green uh, when it uh, it is at the maximum quantum yield at this uh, for example at this wavelength but it can also emit the yellow and orange light so that will uh, have a higher wavelength and it can be detected in the another detector so vice versa can happen so uh, that is what the importance is so the this phenomenon of uh, overlapping is called a spectral overlap all or spillover spillover of the fluorochrome now uh, we want a clear signal to detect uh, this fluorochrome then this is the example if you see uh, the the process the process to reduce the spectral overlap or the process to reduce the spillover of one fluorochrome into the detector of another fluorochrome is called as compensation and for that specifically use controls are called as compensation control now what are compensation controls these are nothing but the uh, single color stain uh, controls in which we know only we add only a single color to adjust this spectral overlap now for example this is a fitc stain uh, tube uh, or fitc stain sample what happens if this is fitc um, and this is pe then this fit we have added only fitc but it is also showing signal in the p so this uh, emission spectra of fitc is uh, spilling over into the p channel so the same another uh, example is pe the p uh, emission spectra is spilling over into the fitc so to reduce that what is done the voltages of the respective uh, detectors is adjusted now here the this whatever uh, spilling of fitc happening into the p uh, is subtracted and uh, it is adjusted because it's a control and we know that it is only fitc we have adjusted the detectors voltage to make it fitc positive only and these settings are further copied into the testing so this process is called as compensation so very crucial part to understand or to and this is done to reduce the spillover of the fluorochrome so the key here while designing the flow cytometry or multi uh, multicolor flow cytometry experiment is to spread out the co-expressing markers because definitely we'll have we'll be studying the markers which will be co-expressed for example uh, cd3 and cd4 so all cd4 cells will express cd3 that's so that it becomes a co-expressing um, markers on the same so to if if at all we select the two fluorochromes for that uh, for these two markers which are excited by the same laser for example this is 488 laser which excites fitc as well as pe then there is a chances of spillover because these two are closed then to reduce this we can select the such fluorochromes which are distant from each other or which are excited by the different laser so one fluorochrome we can take fitc which is excited by the laser and another we can take apc which is excited by the red laser so we can stain cd3 by fitc and we can stain cd4 by apc so this will reduce this spillover substantially so this uh, this way we can reduce the spillover and we can have a clear data the next point to consider here is the stain index in other words the brightness of fluorochrome so every fluorochrome uh, when it 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 has uh, this property called as stain index so uh, if on x axis it is the intensity of the uh, fluorochrome so measured in terms of mfi that is the median fluorescence intensity so uh, mfi of positive signal and mfi of negative signal divided by standard deviation two times the standard deviation of the negative signal is called as stain index in simple words it is the resolution of the positive and the negative peak so that is called as brightness of a fluorochrome so i you will better understand with this example for example these are the three uh, fluorochromes apc uh, pe alexa fluor 700 and pacific blue if you see uh, the position of the peaks the 
negative peak and positive peak in Pacific blue are comparatively closer than Alexa floor uh, 700 than APC. So uh, the there is a better resolution of positive and negative peak in APC than Pacific blue. So this is nothing but a brightness of a fluorochrome. So the different fluorochromes have different brightness and this information uh, is very important while designing uh, or assigning a fluorochrome to the marker. Uh, this is the uh, stain index calculated based on this formula considering the MFI of positive and negative peak and when the, it is compared the uh, we can see uh, the PE is the brightest uh, fluorochrome whereas APC H7 is the dimmest one. Uh, the, the important point here to note is that the stain index is dependent upon the cytometer. So uh, two different cytometers will have different uh, resolution of the same fluorochrome is possible and again it is relative to one fluorochrome to another. So we are comparing PE is more brighter than uh, APC H7. So that is how it is. So PE is brighter and so we need to understand whether uh, which fluorochrome is bright and which fluorochrome is uh, dim. Uh, in another way the uh, I can say is PE produces more Yield, uh, quantum yield or more photons than APC H7. So that is what the MFI of a positive peak is higher in case of P than uh, MFI of positive peak of APC H7. So that is why P is brighter than APC H7. Now uh, next I would like to discuss with you about tandem dyes. Uh, when uh, if you consider a single fluorochrome, it has excitation spectra and emission spectra. But when the uh, when two such dyes are bring uh, are brought together, such a way that uh, ex uh, the the donor dye or dye A, you can say, is excited, the the emitted energy in terms of light that is, that is nothing but an energy is it it, it falls into the excitation spectra of another that is called as acceptor. So the energy uh, is taken accepted by this donor and it is transferred to this another molecule that is acceptor and this acceptor molecule R and molecule B or di B emits the light so emission. So because of this what happens the uh, on the same excitation we have uh, another's uh, emission. And this is possible because of the, the, the mechanism is called as uh, FRED, that's fluorescence resonance energy transfer. So, uh, the example here is PE and PE sci fi. We will better understand here. So, PE, if it is uh, used alone, it emits at 578, but PE sci fi emits at 667. So, the donor uh, die here is P, and acceptor die here is sci fi. So uh, when, for example, for PE sci-fi, excitation spectra will remain same as like PE, but emission spectra will differ than PE, 667. So the advantage here is we have availability of more number of dyes uh, because earlier it was only PE or sci-fi. Now it is PE and sci-fi and PE sci-fi. So we can analyze more markers uh, here. And another uh, advantage here is they have a higher stoke shift. So what is the stoke shift of a fluorochrome? It's nothing but a difference in the excitation and emission spectra. Uh, the fluorochromes having higher stoke shift give better resolution because if the excitation and emission spectra are closer then detector will detect the laser light itself. So that's that is why the, the, the fluorochromes having higher stoke shifts are preferred. So and that is been advantage of the tandem dyes, but at the same time, it, they should be used with caution because they are susceptible to floto bleaching. Uh, because if the bond between the donor and acceptor dye breaks, then uh, it will be have so then the detection will be different. It will give uh, false positive uh, results. Uh, at the same time, these tandem dyes are susceptible to pH and temperature conditions of the buffers, especially the seismic atoms. 
and there also exists a lot to lot variability uh, in between the tandem time so uh, uh, definitely lot to lot variability then vendor to vendor variability is also definitely bigger if you are using from bd then we should use bd throughout the experiment yeah uh, dr patel sorry to interrupt yeah. you uh, you know we are approaching a kind of wrapping up time if you can yes. start that quickly yeah thank you sure 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 i i will uh, finish that first uh, the next point is the uh, fluorochrome selection by laser. So, as uh, this is the same example of the that uh, um, configuration. So, here the trick is we should select if you want to select the fluorochromes from the same laser, then select the extreme uh, fluorochromes uh, because the fluorochrome uh, present at the center have a tendency to spill over into the other. So preferentially select the extreme uh, uh, fluorochromes. Next rule is the rule of crisscross. So this is next point is assigning the fluorochrome to the antibody. The rule of crisscross is uh, assign a bright fluorochrome to weak expressing marker and a dim fluorochrome to strong expressing marker. So here the example is suppose this is a weak expression and this is a strong expression. Uh, then if you uh, stain a weak expression with the dim dye the signal becomes weak or vice versa when the strong expression marker is stained with the bright dye the expression is too uh, so that will lead to a spillover uh, through the example uh, this is a cd3 and uh, ccr7 expression so because ccr7 is a dim marker and the upper panel is the bright dyes so you can see uh, this uh, population are better resolved than this lower panel where these are the dim dyes. So this population is poorly resolved in this case. So that is why for a dim marker, preferentially use the brighter dyes. The another example for the CD4 and CD3 simply. So CD4, CD3 is better resolved because CD3 population is abundant. But CD3 negative CD4 monocytes are uh, poorly resolved if the dye is dim compared to the dye if the dye is bright so that is why the rule of crisscross is next is antigen exclusion suppose uh, there is a chance that uh, we have a fluorochrome which do spill over so in that case uh, assign those fluorochrome to the mutually ex exclusive um, marker for example assign one fluorochrome to cell type a and another to cell type b which do not co-express for example uh, cd3 and cd19 so assign one fluorochrome which have a stronger spillover in the other onto the cell types which do not co-express so that is called as uh, antigen exclusion so uh, next part is the controls uh, while the control must wind up now otherwise the other speakers yeah. will have much less time we'll okay fine, fine the last two slides only okay so unstained controls uh, that is to avoid the autofluorescence uh, fc blocking controls are important to avoid uh, the non specific binding so we should use the fc block reagent to avoid the non specific binding another i want to talk about the fmo controls so this is important for the gating of the uh, fluorochrome the uh, these are fmo matlab fluorescence minus one so that tube we have to add additional tubes to uh, have a better gating because if unstained control is if this is the gate then fmo control will have this gate and this is possible this this happens this spread this phenomenon is called a spread this happens because of there is a spillover of from the other uh, other um, other fluorochromes uh, next is compensation control these are certain rules while setting up the compensation control that this compensation control should be brighter than the sample and uh, this come uh, the beads can be used for the uh, the capture beads can be used uh, instead of cells which gives a better positive and negative population so the compensation control should have a positive and negative population which is brighter and uh, uh, important uh, the next is we can swap the uh, antibodies for example if you have team 3 in the in in the uh, uh, in the panel then the team 3 is a dim marker so we can use cd3 uh, instead of team 3 in the compensation control 
and uh, do not substitute the tandem dyes for because the spectral properties differ so these are important uh, tips i can give here uh, titration of antibody it is suggested to uh, do the titration uh, because uh, as um, less antibody will have a low affinity and excess antibody will result in the false negative proson effect uh, proson effect that, uh, as we observed in antigen antibody interactions so uh, titrate the antibody generally a two fold serial dilution is recommended and select the sweet spot where the better resolution is obtained with respect to uh, that marker so that is what the titration is uh, important this is the last slide just uh, to sum up uh, the first to know the flow cytometer the spillover introduced the spread so reduce spillover into the uh, panel and the brightness understand the brightness of the fluorochrome because it impacts the resolution and the uh, appropriate controls are uh, important to maintain the data integrity so overall if this is followed then the polychromatic flow cytometry should be easier than but, uh, thank you very much i hope i could uh, pass on some uh, information about flow cytometry panel design to you uh, thank you for the opportunity Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Patil. Uh, so we do have a few uh, five to seven minutes buffer uh, in the lunch break, which I will uh, like to take advantage of. Thank you for an exhaustive coverage uh, of the topic. I think it is a, a, a wonderful introduction for beginners as well as those who want to thank refresh you. their concepts. Uh, there are two questions which uh, I will allow, uh, uh, one from the YouTube and one from the WebEx session. So Shilpa, go ahead and read those questions out. Uh, so, this is the question by Saranya. Uh, is the brightness of the staining index directly proportional to the cell composition of the sample? A uh, brightness of staining index doesn't uh, proportion to the. Uh, read, read that again. She yeah. read it again. Hold on. Brightness yeah. of staining index directly proportional to the cell composition of the sample. Uh, brightness and stain index are the same. Okay. If the marker is a bright a marker is strong then we should not assign it the uh, bright brighter fluorochrome that's the point and uh, because the marker will be strong then the more fluorochrome will bind to the cell and it will result into the higher uh, fluorescence so that is what the crisscross rule is so the next question Shilpa. so the next question is from uh, jasira saeed from youtube live streaming what if we have a sample which can be excited by the same laser then how will we reduce the spillover yeah uh, that's what uh, if, if i go to this slide uh, so if if these are the excited by the same laser for example violet they are excited by the same laser so preferentially use the extreme uh, marker and if you are keeping the compensation controls then we can definitely uh, control this spillover so it is possible okay so uh, thanks dr patel i wish we had uh, time a little more to address many other questions but uh, i guess we can always uh, get back to participants at an individual basis your contact information is also shared uh, so many of them might contact you directly so thanks once again for a wonderful presentation and we look forward to your continued participation today thank you very much thank so, you uh, we can move on now to the next uh, part of this session, which is a tutorial. Uh, I think it, it dovetails wonderfully into what uh, Dr. Patel introduced us into. It highlights basic immunophenotyping. Uh, what we've chosen to show today uh, is a protocol uh, that uh, deals with basic CD4, CD8 immunophenotyping and absolute counting. Uh, this is kind of like a, 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 a you know, mainstay of several diagnostic uh, settings for flow cytometry. And we'll get into that ASAP. Uh, to begin with, we'd like to just run a quick introductory uh, clip uh, for our facilities here at NIRH uh, that have hosted uh, this workshop. And we'll start with this really quick uh, introductory video.
So thanks for that introductory clip. Uh, hope uh, most of you had a chance to look at uh, the site at which this uh, online workshop was created. Uh, just to uh, you know talk to you a bit about uh, this laboratory. Uh, this laboratory has uh, actually started off as a regular uh, virology laboratory. It was gradually converted into a biosafety level two star facility that allows uh, analysis of uh, you know viral samples uh, from pathogens like uh, HIV. Uh, the initial work in this laboratory was primarily with uh, HIV, uh, but then we all know what happened last year, and uh, we were mobilized. Uh, since last April, in fact, uh, to start uh, our testing activities, we had to repurpose the laboratory. Uh, we have tested to date around 1.5 lakh samples. Uh, this uh, laboratory was also identified as a site for a national high throughput uh, COVID-19 testing center. And you may have seen our uh, instrument, the COBA 6800. Uh, this can perform about 1,000 to 1,200 uh, COVID-19 diagnostic tests per day. And in fact, uh, that's pretty much what we are doing as we speak. The laboratory is also equipped with uh, cutting edge immune monitoring technology, uh, which includes an analyzer, a high throughput sorter, uh, an LE spot reader, uh, and of course, facilities to perform uh, ELISA. So uh, we welcome collaborations, we welcome inquiries, uh, and we are happy to help uh, to the best extent that we can. So with this uh, kind of brief introduction, we can start uh, the uh, tutorial video uh, that uh, uh, should take us through uh, basic uh, immunophenotyping of CD4, CD8, and counting of these cells. So this is the Faxaria fusion flow cytometer in our facility. It is an analyzer come a sorter. As you know, flow cytometer majorly comprises of three parts. That is the fluidics, optics, and electronics part. So this is the fluidics part of the machine. So this is the ethanol tank. This is the sheath tank. This is the waste tank. And these are the tanks for different liquids, which are used for cleaning of the machine. Next, we move on to the optics part. As you see, this machine comprises of five lasers. So these are the switches for the laser, which are labeled with their respective wavelengths. 355 is for UV laser. 405 is for violet laser. 488 is for blue laser. 561 is for yellow green laser. And 640 is for the red laser. Now these are the filters of the optics part. Now this is the flow cell where your sample interacts with the laser beam. And as you know, it is a sorter. These are the deflection plates where your cells of interest are deflected and they are sorted in the collection tubes. Now this is the sample loading port where you load your sample tube. This is the FaxDiva software and as you can see on top, it shows the configuration of the machine that is 2 blue, 4 yellow green, 2 red, 2 UV and 4 violet. It shows that the machine has been connected and the fluidic startup has been done. Now let's move on to the topic of the module that is absolute count of T-cell subset. Absolute lymphocyte count in peripheral blood, it has been reported as an independent prognostic factor in many diseases like HIV infection, multiple myeloma, as well as in SARS-CoV-2 infection. In HIV infected people, CD4 lymphocyte count is routinely measured to judge the effectiveness of highly active antiretroviral therapy and to modify the therapy regime if required. 
Now there are different methods yeah. that are available for absolute count. First being the hemocytometer, the second is the flow cytometer. Now for flow cytometer, we usually use liquid counting beads. Alternatively, you can also use the commercially available tubes which already have beads in them. The advantages of measuring absolute count by flow cytometry are as follows. It is an easy and rapid method. Also, it is time saving. Additionally, it provides information on cell size and cell shape. Also, large number of cells are counted rapidly and it has high level of precision. So moving on to the protocol of processing samples for absolute count. We use stained lice and no wash method as washing can lead to as washing leads to loss of beads as well as the cells. So to start with, homogenize the whole blood sample by thorough manual mixing. Please note, do not vortex the whole blood sample. After mixing, pipette 50 microliter of sample to a polystyrene tube using reverse pipetting. Then stain the sample using desired antibody cocktail. So here we use CD45, CD3, CD4 and CD8. Then mix gently by vortexing and incubate for 20 minutes at room temperature in dark. After 20 minutes of incubation, add 450 microliter of 1x fat slicing solution, vortex and incubate for 15 minutes at room temperature in dark with intermittent vortexing every 5 minutes. After 15 minutes of incubation with lysis, immediately prior to using liquid counting beads, vortex the vial properly for 30 to 40 seconds, add 50 microliter of the liquid counting beads in each tube and then now your sample is ready for acquisition. An important factor here in absolute count is reverse pipetting. So as you know that absolute count is based on comparing cellular events to bead events, precise volume of blood and beads are required to be pipetted and hence to achieve this, we use reverse pipetting technique. Now reverse pipetting technique, it is basically carried out to ensure the exact volume of blood and beads are added to the ASO tube. Now moving on to the video tutorial. Now before adding the blood in the acid tube, mix the blood well. For reverse pipetting, double press the pipette and aspirate the blood. And while dispensing the blood in the acid tube, we do single press and release the exact volume of blood at the bottom of a 5 ml polystyrene tube. Now switch off the light and add the antibodies cocktail in the acid tube. After adding the antibody cocktail, mix gently and incubate at room temperature for 20 minutes in dark. Now during the incubation period, prepare 1x fax lysis solution by diluting 10x fax lysis solution with deionized water. Now add 450 microliter of 1x fax lysis solution. 1x fax lysis solution is added in 1 is to 9 ratio. Here, since we add 50 microliter of blood, we add 450 microliter of fax lysis solution for RBC lysis. After adding 1x fax lysis solution, vortex and incubate at room temperature for 15 minutes with intermittent vortexing every 5 minutes. Now after 15 minutes of incubation, we add the beads. 
Please note that the liquid counting beads should be at room temperature before addition and also it is important to vortex the bead mixture properly before adding into the acid tube as the beads settle down during storage. Now add 50 microliter of beads to the acid tube. Mix gently. Vortex the sample and now your sample is ready for acquisition. Load the tube in sample loading port. We have already made a template for this experiment as you can see. And now the acquisition has started. So while doing this experiment to remove debris, we generally set threshold on forward scatter. But beads being smaller, they almost overlap with the debris. And therefore to distinguish beads from debris, here we are using fluorescent channel which is Fitzy, because beads are highly fluorescent in all the channels. We acquire at least 5000 bead events. In the second plot, now you can see the beads. Then we have gated on single cells, then on lymphocytes, monocytes and neutrophils. From lymphocytes we then gate on CD3 positive cells which are T cells. These T cells are further distinguished as CD8 positive T cells and CD4 positive T cells. This is the statistics table which shows frequency of the gated populations. So now you can see on the screen that staining has happened properly. Unload the tube. After acquisition, you can also export the data in FCS format and you can also select desired parameters. This exported data then can be analyzed into a third party software. Yeah, so we've paused the, uh, the video here, uh, just wanted to make this a little bit of an interactive session. So uh, I would urge the participants to uh, have like a notepad and a pen or a pencil available because the next part of this uh, tutorial will involve uh, you to perform an exercise and uh, uh, would request you to pay particular attention to what is being shown to you right now. This will enable you to successfully address the exercise that we will pose uh, for you to uh, uh, finish uh, at the end of the tutorial. Okay, so we can go ahead now. After exporting the data, now we are going to see how to analyze this data using a third party software. So today we are going to show you how to use Flojo for the analysis. This is how the Flojo workspace looks. We have already imported our samples into the workspace. If you want to import your samples into the workspace, simply just drag them. You can also create groups and add your sample to the group. When you use multiple fluorochrome in the experiment, there are chances of spectral overlap. And to account for this, you need to do compensation. For compensation, you can either use beads or cells to stain with single fluorochrome at a time. So these are our compensation file for each fluorochrome that we have used in the experiment. For compensation, click on compensation icon and check if the negative and positive population gates are proper for each fluorochrome. 
once you confirm the gate, view matrix. Lojo creates compensation matrix. Whichever matrix you want to apply on your sample, you have to select that. and drag it on the sample. Here you can see that the color has changed and the new compensation has been applied to the sample. So now our sample is ready for the analysis. So let's double click on the sample and we see this plot. So first we are going to gate on single cells. On X axis, I'm going to select forward scatter area and on Y axis, I'm going to select forward scatter height. As area and height increase proportionally, we have selected these two parameters. I'm going to use polygon gate and make a gate for single cells. But in this single cells, we don't know where the beads are because beads are smaller in size and they overlap with the debris population. So therefore, to gate on the beads, we have used fluorescent channel because beads are highly fluorescent in all the channels. So on x-axis, I'm going to select FITSI and on y-axis, SSE area. You can also customize the axis. So these are our highly fluorescent bead population. Using the square gate, I'm going to gate on beads. Also check if the gate is correct. Now, from the single cells, using CD45 on x-axis and side scatter on y-axis, we are going to get different populations like lymphocytes, monocytes, and neutrophils. As you can see, CD45 expression differs in all these populations. So let's get on lymphocyte first. then monocytes, adjust the gate, and finally neutrophils. Here we selected CD45 because CD45 is a pan leukocyte marker. As T cells come from lymphocyte population, we are going to select this population of lymphocytes and gate on CD3 positive cells. CD3 is a marker expressed by T cells, and hence I'm going to label these cells as CD3 positive. T cells. From these T cells, we can further distinguish them on the basis of CD4 and CD8 into CD4 positive. and CD8 positive pieces. A 
again, we can customize the axis. After getting all the desired populations, now we are interested in the statistics of these populations. For that, click on table editor, select your desired populations and drag the samples in table editor. Because we are interested in counts, I'm going to change the statistics from frequency to count. If you have more than one sample, then you can apply similar statistics on all the samples or the selective samples using iteration menu. So now our data is ready to export. For exporting, we are going to use a file, an Excel sheet, select the location, and create table. So in the Excel sheet, we have got count data for beads, CD4 lymphocytes, and CD8 lymphocytes. We can use these values and paste them in a formula to calculate absolute CD4 and CD8 count. When we do absolute count, we simply compare cellular events to bead events. And this is the formula we use to get absolute count, where we divide the number of positive cellular events by number of bead events multiplied by liquid counting bead concentration divided by sample volume. From the Excel sheet, we got CD4 count as 6,461, bead count as 9,937, in this experiment, we have used bead concentration 1005. We used 50 microliter of blood uh, bead solution divided by sample volume, which was 50 microliter blood. And when you calculate this, value comes to 653 cells per microliter, which is your absolute CD4 count. You can use similar calculation for CD8 count. You just have to replace the CD4 value by CD8 value. I hope you have understood the calculation. And for your practice, we have given you a problem where you can see three plots. Please pay attention to the axis. We have also provided you bead concentration, which is 1000 beads per microliter. And you have to calculate absolute CD4 and CD8 count. You have five minutes to calculate the CD4 and CD8 count. Post your values in the chat box and your five minutes start now. Yeah, uh, everybody, uh, don't worry. Snehal is a little strict about it. But we'll give you we'll give you an additional uh, uh, two three minutes. So in about seven eight minutes, uh, we will uh, disclose the uh, answer and discuss the solution.
So we're already starting to see some answers come in. Great to see that. Uh, just for those who may not have remembered or noted the formula, we're also flashing back to the uh, formula so that you all can uh, note the formula from here. Okay, we'll keep this up for another two, three minutes. Okay, everybody, uh, great to see the participation. We are very happy to say that we are seeing correct answers both on the YouTube uh, stream as well as uh, the WebEx. Uh, so looks like we were successful and most of you have been uh, very quick on the uptake. So we will now go ahead with uh, the solution uh, just to kind of uh, finish the exercise. And this is the answer for absolute CD4 and CD8 count. I hope you all have got the correct answer. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> just to wrap this session up, uh, you can see here the slide or that has uh, references, uh, which includes our own work also. Uh, where we have ex extensively used this uh, technique uh, to uh, enumerate the absolute count for CD4 and CD8 uh, T cells uh, from HIV infected individuals, from uh, uh, individuals who are uh, suffering from COVID-19. In fact, uh, 
the uh, uh, the past uh, sample, in fact, that uh, you saw the data from, uh, was uh, one such individual. Uh, and uh, you know, just to extrapolate, uh, I don't know if any of you are aware. I hope I think most of you might be that you know when we do report CD4 and CD8 counts, uh, why do we look at both these counts, right? So one is obviously to look at whether you know at an individual subset level, that is either at the level of CD4 or CD8, there has been uh, some kind of uh, depletion or there has been some kind of lymphopenia that has occurred. Uh, but very often, especially in the case of HIV infection, uh, these two counts are integrated together in what is called as the CD4, CD8 ratio. And uh, there is a, a normal healthy ratio range, which is uh, anywhere between 1.6 to 2. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the ratio is uh, designated as CD4 is to CD8, which means that the, the CD4 uh, count roughly exceeds the CD8 count by a fold of around 1.6. This is, uh, uh, you know, interesting because not everyone's count remains the same all the time. But uh, in a healthy individual, this is more or less the range in which you would get uh, a healthy count. And uh, for those of you who have solved the exercise, you could probably also do the counting for you know CD8. So it's it's a good thing for you to 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 finish this and check the CD4 CD8 ratio, and then you will realize uh, yourself uh, uh, whether uh, this uh, individual uh, was uh, apparently healthy or uh, not. Okay. Uh, so with this, uh, I'd like to uh, also bring to light. Uh, some of our publications that are mentioned on this slide. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'd urge you to go through these uh, papers uh, to tell us uh, what you think about it uh, and to ask us any questions or queries uh, that you might have. So uh, with that, uh, we can get into specific questions if there are any. Uh, so uh, I'll go through the uh, uh, chat box and let's see if we can come up with some uh, Questions. All right, so I don't see any specific uh, Hello? Hello? Yes, I don't see any specific questions here uh, in the chat box. Uh, looks like, uh, anyway, most of the people uh, uh, were managed to do the exercise, which was wonderful to see. Uh, it's uh, an interactive. Uh, so, so hold on. I see one question. Shilpa, can you read the question? Uh, sometimes we get dual positive cells. How to go about it? Okay. So, uh, uh, any idea who's asked this question? Uh, Dr. Taposhi does. Yeah, and uh, affiliation from anywhere? Okay. Is this from the YouTube or the WebEx? WebEx. Okay. So, Dr. Das, uh, thank you for your question. I think we uh, 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 this is a very real-world issue. Um, typically, uh, double positive cells are present in most samples, uh, but uh, these are, for the point of CD4, CD8 counting, excluded. Uh, our gates, if you may have noticed, uh, do not include the uh, double positives. Sometimes they come, you know, uh, more CD4 than CD8 positive. Sometimes they are more CD8 than CD4 positive. Uh, I guess you mean those subsets of cells. Uh, I can tell you functionally these cells are important, uh, especially in healthy adult individuals. These cells constitute uh, highly potent uh, antiviral uh, 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 T cells. But from the points of view of count, uh, they apparently are not in a high enough number to influence the count significantly. Uh, so uh, we tend to exclude these uh, cells and focus on the main populations. Yeah, but that's a great point. And, and these can be focused on separately if you want to enumerate only the double positives and then try to see if that uh, changes under any uh, conditions. Anything more? Yeah, so uh, I see another question uh, from Bhavna Thakur. Uh, how we can use this technique uh, of absolute count for cancer. Uh, so I think uh, I'm not an expert in, in oncology, but I think we can definitely agree that, you know, cancer also uh, results in immunomodulation. Uh, and uh, some of this immunomodulation can result in uh, 
altered migration of cells. Uh, it can result in uh, you know depletion of uh, uh, cells uh, also due to cell death and uh, lymphopenia. Uh, or in fact, the other way around. You know, uh, uh, flow cytometry is extensively used uh, not just for CD4 and CD8 uh, uh, T cells, but other subsets of T cells to understand. Uh, you know. Uh, in cancers such as uh, lymphomas and leukemias, uh, where you can phenotype not just CD4s and CD8 T cells, but also cells uh, that are subsets within this uh, uh, category. Yeah. Okay. So, in fact, I would recommend uh, uh, I would recommend that uh, you know uh, you can uh, go to our TCS website, and there uh, uh, you know we have multiple workshops and. Uh, uh, other uh, resources that are available for you uh, to look at specifically that has answered uh, its use in uh, 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 oncology. So, Shilpa, can you read that next question, please? Can you please elaborate the calculation of CD4 and CD8 positive cell? How the number of beads are calculated? So, uh, the beads are uh, essentially you know, that's why we use reverse pipetting, okay? So the beads come at a fixed concentration. This is a commercially available product that comes in a fixed concentration. And we know how many beads we are taking because we know that the, the concentration of the beads is fixed. So when we take a certain volume from that container, we'll be taking a fixed number of beads. And by ensuring that we do reverse pipetting and accurate pipetting, we are delivering the exact number of beads that we have pipetted into our tube. And when we acquire, we thus know how many beads have been acquired. And then this is the values that you will feed into the formula to calculate the absolute count in the volume of blood that was typed. Okay, so I'm going to wait online uh, if there are uh, any more. Otherwise, within a minute or two, I will introduce uh, our next speaker. Uh, just to confirm, uh, Dr. Srivastava, are you online? Yes, I am online, yeah. Yeah, great. So just give us a minute and I'll, I'll introduce you just to see if there are any more questions. Okay, so I think we can move ahead. Uh, I think we're going perfectly on schedule now uh, with our next uh, domain expert, uh, having you know been introduced wonderfully to the basic concepts and then hopefully uh, also having been introduced how a, a very basic technique of immunophenotyping is carried out uh, for an important diagnostic test. Uh, we can move on uh, <clears throat> to a kind of a little bit more advanced level of uh, phenotyping. And uh, this uh, uh, will be, uh, you know, presented by uh, Dr. Rupesh uh, 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 Srivastava, uh, who is an associate professor at the Department of Biotechnology at Ames, New Delhi. So, Dr. Srivastava uh, did his PhD from NCCS uh, in 2011, and then his postdoc was at two places, uh, initially at the Columbia University Medical Center and then uh, Roswell Park Cancer Institute. Uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Srivastava, if you had a chance to interact with Dr. Paul Wallace there, uh, but uh, I, I know that he he was uh, somebody there. Yeah, yeah. He was he was a director of flow cytometry there right. department. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. had been a number of chances. We yeah. 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 basically we, yeah. 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 He he has got, he has uh, participated extensively in our Indo-US uh, workshops also. Anyway, uh, so Dr. Srivastava's uh, research focuses on the cellular and molecular interactions between immune and bone systems that is osteoimmunology, and his group for the first time highlighted the specific role of immune system in the development of pathophysiology of postmenopausal osteoporosis, uh, leading to the establishment of a new field of biology proposed by him as immunoporosis. So the immunology of osteoporosis, uh, he is also a recipient of the G.P. Talwar Young Scientist Award, both from the Indian Immunological Society and ISSRF, which is the Reproductive uh, Society. Uh, he has uh, more than 65 publications, and we look forward to uh, listening to you today, Dr. Srivastava. Please take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that generous uh, introduction of mine. And uh, I would just like to share my slides to have had the rights for that. Uh, just a minute. So is it visible to everyone? Not yet. Hold on. Yeah, it's there. 
Can you just okay. go to slide slide view, please? Yeah. Now it's fine. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's fine. So basically, uh, first of all, I would just like to thank the organizers for today's invitation for me and inviting me for this wonderful workshop, online workshop. And so I have kept my talk in a such a way that uh, I would be dealing with basically, uh, before I start, I would thank Dr. Gogai also who invited me here. So he's a very close friend of mine and we have been uh, interacting on a various number of research and uh, personal issues and he's a very good friend of mine and very nice person. So now moving ahead with the talk. So I have kept my talk in a way that I think uh, the people who are there, the students, the postdocs, the PhD fellows, and maybe even faculty and scientists also. So how uh, flow cytometry has helped me in uh, delineating or establishing a very important role of regulatory B cells in osteoporosis. So this is a very novel discovery, which we discovered this year itself, and we published in uh, April, May this year itself. So first time we have shown how regulatory B cells are basically can also be involved in regulating bone inflammatory conditions, especially in osteoporosis. So this is the first time we did that. And flow cytometry had a very important role in this, uh, more than 80 to 90% of experiments, which we do. And uh, since a lot of people must be immunologists here, so they can understand how flow cytometry is very much important for uh, doing your immunological research. So before going that, moving ahead, I would just want to I think, yeah. So what we do basically, so my group is basically osteoimmunology group, we call it. And this is basically the birthplace of immunoporosis with the field which we coined and started in uh, 2018 itself. And it is a highly uh, respectable and is now well accepted in all the scientific fraternity all around with a lot of publications. More than 10 publications have already cited this word itself. And the papers are coming up who are now using this word so basically the immunology of osteoporosis. So this is what our group does. So I'm telling you this because this is related to the research what we are doing here. And this is a very small niche. So that's why the, uh, I just want to make the users very much uh, just priming them keep what we are doing and then only they can appreciate what I'm going to talk today. So our aim is basically to unravel the nexus between the bone and immune system. The, the bigger umbrella is the osteoimmunology. Uh, so that we can better understand bone with respect to various other organs because bone is a very important organ and every year uh, more than 10 percent of your bone is basically replaced it is not only a structural a component of your body it is harboring your hemato hematopoietic stem cells your mesenchymal stem cells are also there so it's very important organ and uh, organ and also your immune system is basically developing from these hsc's and that's why our whole your immunity is basically linked not only your immune system we have also gone to looking how this is also regulating your fertility, how pathogens are also interacting with it, how, how we can, the environmental pollutants also basically are very much important in regulating the osteoimmune system. We're also looking how we can basically use phytotherapeutics to basically tackle the bone loss with respect to osteoporosis. Recently, the gut microbiome story has also been covered in our lab. Along with that, probiotics and various other dietary supplements are also being used nowadays to basically manage the, these osteoporotic conditions. So the first areas in my lives are osteoimmunology, immunoprocess, osteomicrobiology, nutrition, toxicology, fertility, therapeutics, pathogens. And also we are looking into how COVID-19, long-term implications of COVID-19 on bone health. So these are some of our uh, uh, things which we are doing uh, then and now. And these are very, a very small group where we are very active with respect to the bone and the immune system on various fronts. And this was the thing which we discovered in 2018 as already talked about. We are the pioneers of basically how TREG and ds 70 cell access is very important in osteoporosis. And also we have recently added this BREG story also to this access, which is very much important in regulating uh, bone loss in osteoporosis. So if you know the naive T cells can be activated either into various lineages and based upon their inflammatory and anti-inflammatory properties, and basically they are going to induce bone loss uh, or inhibit bone loss, we have divided, we have categorized them into osteoprotective lineages and osteolethal lineages. So these are the, some of the cells, basically the major one being IL, uh, the DS17, the IL-17, the major uh, cytokine, which basically enhances osteoclastogenesis from these osteoclast precursors, which are the monocytes in the bone marrow. And also if you look, we have other cells also, which are basically all inhibitory in nature. The BREX we have added recently in that, but TREX, both CD4 and CD8 TREX are also inhibitory along with your TH1, TS2. 
So this was very important because this is already uh, cited 84 times, this amino process thing. And more than 15,000 views have been already been there and more than 3,000 downloads have been there. Uh, so, and also one of our research on probiotics was basically one of the most cited uh, article on bone reports uh, of the of this in the last two to three years. And due to this uh, contribution of ours, this immunoporosis story, we, we were also covered on the front page of the Immunity Journal, uh, part of the 25th anniversary issue in April 2019. So this is what we have done, what we have contributed lately. So now coming back to the story of today, so I will be talking about how we discovered the role of BREX in uh, osteoporosis and how flow cytometry has helped a lot in this. So before going into that, I will just brief all of the viewers here and all the participants here, how, what are B cells and how BREX are uh, uh, different uh, subsets of these B cells. So I will take this major timeline as a, as a timeline key, what has happened in the past years. So if you see from starting from 1890s to 1939, so people discovered substances in the serum which can neutralize basically the toxins, and these were later called as antibodies. And in 48 around, the plasma cells were first of all discovered to show to show that they are making antibodies. And 59, the clonal selection theory along with the heavy and light chain compositions of the antibodies was elucidated. Then comes 63, 64, the affinity maturation was defined uh, in these B cells. And 66, 68, the how T cells are helping the B cells in antibody responses was discovered. So this is very important key that how T cells are also involved in regulating B cell antibodies, generation and affinity maturation and all those things. 70 is the somatic hypermutation and isotype switching was again defined in these B cells, the plasma B cells. And 88, the B cell receptor signaling via the IgG alpha and IgG beta signaling was further uh, discovered. And in 89 to 94, the CD40 and CD40 interaction was uh, basically uh, being shown how the T cells are helping the B cells. And the suppressor B cells, the, basically this is the word suppressor B cell was initially given to the regulatory B cells, which were after almost uh, uh, almost some, uh, some years, these were ultimately coined as regulatory B cells. So these are the BREGs. And during the past 20 years, from 2008 to 2021, the BREGs have been, uh, the this particular domain of immunology has been bombarded with a lot of research. And they have been basically given the name of regulatory vessels because they can regulate various inflammatory and autoimmune responses. And a lot of discoveries has been done. But nobody has ever shown you how BREGs can also regulate your uh, bone loss in case of osteoporosis. Because osteoporosis was initially, and is still considered by the majority of people that is only a, estrogen deficient condition or an aging conditions and in, in which the your bone loss is happening. But slowly people have now recognized and we are basically the at the forefront of this key how uh, these uh, uh, your immune system is basically a very uh, playing a very larger part in your uh, providing your bone loss conditions or regulating these bone loss conditions in osteoporosis also. And that's why we name this now as immunoporosis. So in 2021, we discovered that how BREX, uh, they, they regulate both osteoclastogenesis in, uh, in vitro and also in vivo in case of your mice. And now we are doing the same story in case of your humans also, and we are getting very exciting results. And if everything goes online, then we would be also be uh, able to report that at earliest. So we now come to the, what are the B cell subsets and how they are developed. So B cells are basically developed in the bone marrow of the fetal liver. So you can see here from the stem cells, pro B cells, then the pre B cells are there which are at an immature stage and they are in the periphery mature into either the B1 cells or the B2 B cells. The B1 B cells are basically from origin from the fetal liver and they are found in the mucosal and peritoneal cavity. And the follicular cells and your marginal zone B cells are basically uh, generated in the bone marrow and uh, they are found in the spleen and lymphoid organs. Apart from these three, we also now have a defined subset, established subset, which we now we call as uh, regulatory B cells. So how these B cells play a role in your immunology or the immune system is very important. So we have two arms now. One is all of you know the humoral immunity that is uh, antibody dependent. That is the humor, the liquid form which has been secreted in the, uh, in the fluid form in the blood uh, that is the serum and this is providing you immunity. And that's why it is called as humoral immunity. And humoral immunity, the only thing which comes in our mind is B cells. It, we don't know okay, that B cells also have various other functions, very important functions which in the last four to five years have gained very much momentum and we call this 
non-humoral immunity that is antibody dependent functions of these B cells. So if you look into the humoral immunity, we all know this, it could be either T dependent or T independent and T dependent and basically requires the, these B cells, they require the T cell help for differentiation and activation of B cells so that they can undergo isotype switching and affinity maturation. But on the other hand, the T independent responses are also there for the, these B cells where no T cell help is required. And uh, that's why the, the resulting antibody produced have do not have any, uh, almost no affinity maturation and very limited isotype switching. Apart from these humoral immunity part or the antibody dependent functions of B cells, we now are appreciating the antibody independent functions of B cells. And in this, the role of regulatory B cells is at the forefront. So it could be basically uh, apart from the antibody, that is your, it could be your cytokine or chemokine dependent, or maybe uh, B cells are also acting as an APCs also to present these antigens to the T cells. So these are also the functions of B cells, which we uh, really don't appreciate, but they are there at, uh, playing a very important role in uh, various inflammatory and physiological responses. So if you see here, the cytokine dependent response, you see we could either have a effective B cells, which are regulating or secreting various inflammatory cytokines, which are then taking care of your uh, various health conditions or are responsible for these health conditions. And also we have these regulatory B cells which are regulating these uh, immune responses from the various immune cells, either it could be D cells or DCs or macrophages or NKT cells, by the secretion of their IL-10, IL-35 and TJ beta. So now, I am basically now interested in uh, dissecting these non humoral functions of B cells. So if you see here, and these are the non humoral functions of B cells, and uh, I, I, I guarantee that most of the people here would not be uh, uh, have never heard these functions or non humoral functions of B cells because they are still not part of the textbooks. They are still in the research uh, literature itself, but slowly people are recognizing it and they are giving it their due importance. So if you see the B cells alone, the secretion of this lymphotoxin alpha 1 beta to an OPG ranker, they, uh, they are responsible for tissue development. Uh, for the example, the tissue homeostasis development of even the gut and PPs or dietary lymphoid organs, that the guards are basically gut associated for tissues, tears patches spleen organization, bone remodeling, and they also promote Th1 cell differentiation through TNF alpha and CCL3. IF1 gamma basically they support Th1 differentiation and even macrophage uh, polarization. And through GMCSF, they increase IL-1 production by DCs. So these are all the inflammatory cytokines and the IL-2, 6, in lymphotoxin alpha, they support T follicular helper, Th1, Th2, and T17 cell responses. So B cells, we have an or the, this B Rex, which through this 10, 35, and TJ beta, they promote T Rex differentiation. TS 17, they suppress that, and also they inhibit osteoclastogenesis. So these are anti-inflammatory functions of these uh, regulatory B cells. So now coming to this B Rex, which are the major ones. So uh, so now moving a step ahead. So before going into how we discovered these B Rex in osteoporosis, I would like to the uh, the viewers to know about the subsets because. There have been a lot of subsets of uh, discovered subsets or established subsets of BREX, but till then we don't have a very, uh, what to say, a very defined marker for BREX, both in case of mice and humans. So if scientists are still discovering that. And the only known thing is that the uh, most of these BREX, they secrete IL-10. So that is the only thing which is basically, we know that you would, okay, the IL-10 secreting B cells could be considered as a part or a, some kind of subsets of BREX. And it is not only the IL-10, but also TJ beta and 35 is also as part of that same repertoire of cytokines. So I would just like to uh, show you the left-hand side of the mice B-Rex subsets, and these are the human B-Rex subsets on the right-hand side. And I specifically circling this BR2 B-Rex. The story is very interesting for this BR2 B-Rex. So these were discovered in 2003 by my uh, PhD mentor, uh, Dr. G.C. Mishra and CCS. So he was there, he was working on B-cell biology and 2003, they reported that if you activate B-cells with uh, uh, TLR4 ligand, for example, your LPS, so these B-cells, uh, these which, which we, they didn't call them regulatory B-cells that time because they were not in 2000, only people, they renamed as regulatory B-cells. And they started the story uh, somewhere around 1998 or 99. And 2002, they started uh, communicating it. So they were not aware that they have discovered a regulatory B cell subset. And they just uh, reported that if you activate the B cells with LPS, these B cells, they via the secretion of uh, membrane bound TJ beta, they're not secreting basically the membrane bound TJ beta present on these uh, B cells activated with LPS. And these B cells were able to induce NRG and CDA T cells. 
So NRE is a kind of condition of non uh, unresponsiveness. That is again a kind of mechanism of tolerance induction in case of your periphery or your other tissues. So they discovered that. They didn't recognize that these were regulatory B cells. So when I joined the lab in 2006, I, I, uh, that time the story of BREX were very much uh, uh, reported all around. And then I asked myself, sir, this is uh, basically you discovered BREX and we haven't gave, uh, gave them the name of regulatory B cells at, th at that time. And during these uh, uh, almost 20 years till now, and what we did, we now uh, wrote a review. And we, in that, again, uh, <laughs> took back this uh, and uh, have gone back here and we renamed it as br 2 BREX. And this has now been reported in only uh, that particular chapter because after that, uh, no more research has been done on how this particular subset of BREX, which are secreting, uh, which are expressing membrane bound TGR beta. But they have been now been given a br 2 BREX. Uh, after 20 years, we have uh, basically uh, reclaimed that. Today, I will be talking about these B10 BREX in mice, which are basically secreting IL-10. Apart from they also have the CD1B, CD5 also as one of the markers uh, along with CD19. And the humans, in case of humans, these 19, 24, and 38 uh, high positive regulatory pieces. So starting, so we have various immunomodulatory functions of regulatory pieces, uh, as I've already talked about. So these are the inhibitory effects of BREX and these are the promoting effects. So promoting are basically, a lot, well, it's all due to this IL-10, beta and 35, and in some cases, some uh, CD1D also, which induces regulatory NK T cells. So these are basically the regulatory or immunomodulatory functions of regulatory B cells, and they are very much important in inflammation and diseases. So these are all the markers which I have put into this particular slide. And they are responsible for suppressing allergy and asthma also, preventing allograft rejection, or they have also been found to suppress inflammation in COVID-19 uh, patients who are recovering. And they have been reported majorly in casing, uh, suppressing or autoimmune conditions, starting from you know, multiple sclerosis, uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, etc. And but uh, as the on the contrary, as with the case with regulatory T cells, they are also basically promoting uh, your tumor because this is uh, basically what the tumor cells are doing. If the immune system is they are basically activated and uh, trying to uh, kick off these tumor cells or the cancer cells on the body, these regulatory cells are basically the basic biggest hurdle. Both the T Rex and B Rex, they somehow they promote these because their work is to dampen the immune response. But in doing so, they don't uh, realize that they are basically helping the tumor cells to grow up. So they also suppress inflammation, which is associated with your various parasites. And recently this has been added to this list. They are also responsible for inhibiting osteoporosis. So now I'm going to start my story, how I discovered this and how flow cytometry has basically played a very novel role of these BREX in osteoporosis. So this is all, this has already been discussed by various subject experts and uh, what is flow cytometry, what are the basic components, and how they have a number of functions there. So I will be taking very few of them, how we have done immunophenotyping, the cytokine analysis, and cell counting, and sorting all those things for devising, uh, for dissecting the role of regulatory B cells in osteoporosis. So the first and the most important point before we started key, to dissect key, how these BREX are important in osteoclastogenesis or osteoporosis was that to do something in vitro. For doing something in vitro or the, through the primary cultures, what we wanted was a population of purified B cells. Because B cells are not easy to isolate from these uh, mice or humans because the, there is no specific marker as we have in case of your regulatory T cells. Okay, the FOXP3 positive T cells are regulatory T cells. So we don't have still have a, a very defined marker for BREX. And also if you want to use these BREX, or doing some culture uh, experiments or some live experiments later on, we cannot basically uh, strain for IL-10 and sort them out because staining for IL-10 will basically lead them to fixation and formalization of these cells, and after that they will be dead. So the, this is the major basic issues, and we still don't have a specific knockout mice which just exclude this IL-10 from only VX. So that is only one one report has recently came in which they have generated those mice and we are still looking forward to whether the, that is going to be a robust system or not. So that is a major drawback. You cannot isolate or sort out regulatory B cells directly from the mice or the humans and do them some cultures. So basically we have to rely on certain markers, certain experimental conditions to generate them 
uh, induce the generation of these BREX. So these BREX are also not that much of uh, the population of these is not hardly from one to five percent in your uh, spleen or your peripheral blood is even very less, less than one percent. So what we did was that we took the mice and we harvested the spleen because spleen is a site where the B cells basically are generated the germinal center reactions. So we took the uh, spleen and we RBC lysed them and we made a single cell suspension and we just, uh, if you can see here that only 40 to 45 percent of the cells are CD19 positive. So spleen as with all the other reports, almost 40 to 50 percent of the cells uh, in spleen are B cells. So this is what we got. But with 40 percent, we cannot do any experiments. We need to have a purity of more than 95 percent. What we did was that we made, we, uh, we took a B cell enrichment cocktail and we either have gone through magnetic, your either positive or negative selection. I think most of the viewers must be aware to what is the magnetic selection is there. If you're doing a direct selection, positive selection, you are just taking the CD19 antibodies, uh, tagging these CD19 positive cells, that is the B cells, and then labeling with the magnetic, these antibodies are labeled with the magnetic bead. And when we put in the magnet, they will be stick around in the, uh, in the tubes and the rest of the cells that is comprising of the other cells apart from uh, your B cells will be uh, discarded. So this is how your positive selection is done and negative selection, the other round, the only we are the, which are basically the untouched B cells, we take antibodies for all other kind of immune cells in the spleen, CD4, CD8, NK, macrophages, DCs, leaving only the B cell uh, antibody. So, so that all the other cells are uh, basically tagged, only the B cells are there which are remaining, which you can later on take. And so if you check the purity of these pieces, also we can use flow cytometry here also. So that you can basically uh, just label these uh, spleen cell, single cell suppression with CD19 and just sort them with a sorter, for example, this BDREA3, which can sort this out and you can collect. So after this negative selection fraction of the sorted cells, you can check the purity, which is more than 95. Sometimes you even get 98 to 99 percent of the purity also it depends upon a lot of conditions, how, how much time you are doing the sorting, what kind of sorting, what the conditions of the sorting are. So there are n number of factors which define the purity and the downstream applications, uh, whether these cells are live or uh, dead. So after this, so the, our first major criteria was to uh, basically isolate this naive B cells and purified B cells, and which we have done. And this is how we basically, with the help of flow cytometry, we determine the purity of. So you cannot determine the purity of these B cells isolated either from negative selection positive selection of flow cytometry because you need a flow cytometer for determining the purity of. So this is again a very important parameter uh, or the use of flow cytometry determining the purity of these isolated B cells or T cells, whatever you are interested in. So this is the major applications of flow cytometry here in case of immunology. This is what I have uh, put on some clouds here, basically what the role of flow cytometry has been in uh, all of my experiments. So here, basically for cell isolation and purity, I I use them. Now coming back, so the next step was the, how I'm going to generate and characterize the regulatory B cells in this isolated uh, B cell population, the purified. So once we got the isolated B cells, which were more than 95% pure, we proceeded for uh, generate, inducing them B, B, uh, B cells into BREX in the presence of LPS. So LPS is an, uh, again one of the well-established protocols for inducing regulatory B cells in these uh, B cells. So after certain time periods, we took five hours, 24 hours, and also 48 hours. And we, after those periods, we checked the induction of the generation of these bases with the help of flow cytometry. And uh, for that, we strained the cells with CD19, 1T, and CD5. These are the markers for regulatory bases after incubating the, with the antibodies for 45 minutes at four degree. And after washing, we then did the intracellular staining for RL10 after fixing the cells, fixation, polymerization buffer is used and we again put the cells on ice for 45 minutes. And after that, again, this flow cytometry is being used here for BREX immunified phenotyping. And this is how we did that. After fixation, we acquired this, and this was the gating strategies which we applied. So if you see here, this is the forward scatter and the side scatter is there. And thus we uh, selected the singlets only. And this is what we, uh, is covered was, I, I was seeing that this was covered in the previous uh, presentations, key, how we have to put the gating and all those things. And the signets, if you see the signets are gated and the CD19 B cells are more than 95% pure. And we are now putting an IL-10 uh, 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 marker on this. And here we have taken the FMO, that is the fluorescence minus uh, one for this IL-10 antibody, just to be sure that there is no non-specific binding. So these are the controls. And we were very much 
uh, happy to see that Lava CT19 positive and 10 positive. This is one subset of BRX. So they were robustly induced. If you see in the media, 4.3% of the cells are only CT19 IL-10 positive. But in case of LPS, it was going around 17.4. So there is, we can see other population of these B cells is coming up. So very robustly, more than four folds of uh, induction of these regulatory B cells were there. I know that most of the people must be thinking only 17.4% of the cells are BRX. So this is doesn't uh, a significant uh, population, but this is because if you see in the screen of hardly 1% of the cells are BRX. And if you induce them to 17%, they do make a lot of difference. Because earlier also we were working on T-Rex and we found that one T-Rex was basically very much capable of inhibiting osteoclast in 100 uh, monocytes. So one T-Rex was able to uh, uh, inhibit differentiation of 100 uh, osteoclasts. And here also in B-Rex, what we calculated was that one B-Rex was efficient to suppress almost 40 to 50 your uh, osteoclasts. So if you see here, the percentage of the CD19 IL10 positive BREX was significantly enhanced as LPS. And also the MFI of that, there's a mean fluorescent intensity, that is a, what uh, each and every cell, how much of IL10 they are containing. This is defined or this is calculated with the help of MFI uh, from the software of flow cytometry analysis, for example, flowing or DIVA, whatever you're having. So there also you can see per cell uh, induction of IL10 is greatly or significantly enhanced. So then we also look at the other population. This is, uh, these are the CT19 positive IL-10 BREX. And if you look into the CT19, IL-61D uh, and CT5 positive BREX, CT1D should be high. And though we could uh, put a marker here for CT5 and 1D, 1D should be high for this side. And again, 0.26 to 3.07 percent. This is again a significant induction of these uh, BREX. So those these BREX were highly significantly enhanced in case of our cultures. So after that, so this is how I identified and quantified this BREX, and this was not possible if we are not having a flow cytometer because any other technique cannot identify and cannot quantify this BREX in vitro or in vivo. So now coming, coming to the next slide. So I don't know why this is coming. This particular, uh, it's not coming earlier. So if I just see here, so role of BREX on osteoclastogenesis. So if you see here, so next we were interested, once we generated this BREX, we were now interested in how they can, whether they are capable of inhibiting osteoclast in vitro. So what we did was that we took the mice, we took out, took out the spleen, we put the LPS term microgram per ml, we negative select the B cells, which were negative selected with more than 95% purity at 2 newton per 6 cells per ml. And LPS was uh, at 10 microgram was taken to induce them after 24 hours. Most of these cells were basically uh, regulatory B cells. On the parallel, what we did was that we harvested bone marrow cells and we cultured them for 24 hours prepared. These are the mono uh, osteoclast precursors. And we now co-cultured these BREX, the LPS induced BREX, and these, your uh, osteoclast, uh, co-cultured. And after four days, we did trap straining. That is a marker for your osteoclast. And what we found was that, and this was done at different cell ratios. If you see here, 10 cells were taken off, 10 is to one, five is to one, and one is to one, with respect to BREX, with this, which is one in all of these. So this is the positive control. MCSF or Rankel is basically added in these monocytes so that they can become your uh, uh, osteoclast. So the osteoclasts are basically multi-nucleated cells, bone resolving cells, and uh, they can have nuclei of up to 200 nuclei also, nucleus in each and every cell. And these are very much active in resolving the bone with the help of acidic environment, HHP, uh, ATP, and all those things are uh, used. So these cells, if you look, these red cells, these multi-nucleated cells are osteoclasts. This is the positive control. And when we started co-culturing these cells with the regulatory B cells in a dose dependent manner, you can see that 10 is to 1, 5 is to 1, 1 is to 1 pay all, everything is basically significantly inhibited. So this is how, and this we have taken just the B cells alone. These are not the B rex. So there was no such similar effect in B cells. Only the re B rex which have been generated with the help of LPS were able to uh, significantly inhibit osteoclastogenesis in vitro. So now, the next question was, what is the factor? How BREX are doing so? If they are inhibiting osteoclastogenesis, then how they are doing so? So since we already knew the IL-10, IL-35, and TJ beta are the major cytokines secreted by BREX, so we also just gave a shot to first the majorly the IL-10. So we did a transfer experiment. In what we just, we want to be sure that it is not cell contact dependent, it is only through soluble mediators. So what we did, we did a transfer experiment. In the transfer, we kept the LPS at 40 B cells, and on the, on the lower surface of the culture plates were your bone marrow cells. Those all the uh, 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 all the things were the same as in the previous experiment. 
and we again did the track for after four days. So if you see again, the similar results were obtained here also. These are the multinuclear osteoclasts, which are basically inhibited. So the similar results uh, with respect to previous, that is, this is again showing that VREs are inhibiting osteoclastogenesis via some soluble factors and not in a cell contact dependent manner. So what is the soluble factor? What we did was that we performed a IL-10 neutralization assay. So we were basically taking a shot at IL-10. So what we did, we put anti-IL-10 antibody in these cultures at one is to one. And this was the isotype. If you see the isotype of anti-IL-10 was not having any inhibitory effect or it's not having any effect. And the moment you put anti-IL-10, all the inhibitory effect of the VREX is gone. So this is how we first define key how basically soluble factors are involved or a cell contact dependent mechanism is involved in this inhibitory mechanism. And then the moment we put anti-IL-10 antibody confirmed, it established that, okay, this is IL-10 cytokine mediated inhibition of osteoclastogenesis by the VREX. So we were very excited, key, okay, we got, got it. And then we did a functional assay. If you see the osteoclast have a very uh, uh, very beautiful acting F acting ring, basically, which is required for resorption of these bones. So this is a for kind of a functional assay. If you see here, the, again, the this uh, morphology is maintained in case of your NTR10 AR. So if you we also did some quantitative measurements for these uh, photographs, number of the cells with more than three nuclear considered osteoclast, that is again going up in case of NTR10. And the area of the osteoclast is also significantly up and in isotype it is down. So basically in isotype, basically the VREX are able to inhibit with the help of IL-10 cytokine, but the moment we are adding IL-10, anti-IL-10, all these IL-10 cytokine has been scratched up or is being basically tethered with this anti-IL-10 antibody not able to induce their inhibitory effects. So now next we are interested in doing the same thing in vivo. So what we did, we created an osteoprotic mice model and for that, we took a C57 or a balanced C female mice of 8 to 12 weeks age, and we removed both the ovaries of these mice bilaterally. That is what's called the estrogen induced. Uh, if you see that estrogen loss induces osteobone loss, that is basically the model for this osteoporosis. And after 45 days, basically, we uh, sacked the mice and analyzed for various bone and immunological parameters. We did uh, salmon, micro CT, ELISA for serum cytokine, bone marrow flow cytometry, and spleen also flow cytometry. We took bone marrow because these are the sites of osteoclastogenesis. We want to be sure of what is happening at these particular immunological sites with respect to your uh, immune system and also spleen because spleen is where the BREX are basically generated. So if you look, so our model was very robustly made, and you can see here the anatomy is, uh, this is the L LV5 region, the tabacular bone from your spinal cord, from the my spinal cord, from not yours. And these are the gold standards. And in case of osteoporosis, you see this is this uh, uh, structural integrity is very much lost due to your bone loss. So our model was very much robustly made. And then we looked into what is the status of B regs in case of both bone marrow, and spleen in case of your sham, that is the control mice, without removing the ovary. And this ovary, in which the ovaries were removed after 45 days, they had an osteoporosis as we have seen in the micro CT. And you can see here that from 4.5, it is going to 50% reduction in your regulatory vessels is observed in your Toby mice in both the bone marrow and the spleen. So this is again CD19 positive, IL-10 positive, and the MFI of IL-10 is also going down significantly. This is one population, 19 IL-10 positive PREX, and the other population that is CD19, CD1 D high, and CD5 is also similarly having the same trend. And the IL-10 is also basically significantly going down in these uh, subsets of PREX. So this is, uh, we have already shown this, that the IL-10 is a major cytokine, which is basically inhibiting osteoclastogenesis. And in vivo also, we are getting a similar trend that since these PREX are going down, so naturally the IL-10 cytokine will also be down in your periphery in the serum. And this has again been reflected in, my, in our next. So here again, we have used flow cytometry for identifying and quantifying VREX in uh, subsets, various subsets in vivo. Apart from these two subsets, we also looked into two other subsets of VREX. One was the CD19 positive, CD11B positive subset, and other was CD19 positive, FOX3 positive subset. So FOX3 is also somehow related with VREX also. One subset is there, which is basically FOX3 positive and uh, IL-10 positive. So this is our, how we again, in the orectomy mice, we again got a significant reduction in these population numbers. So this is again an unpublished data, and we will be publishing it very soon. So again, we have identified these novel subsets, two more subsets in case of your uh, VREX subsets in, in vivo in case of osteoporosis. So I was telling you about uh, the IL-10 cytokine is basically the major uh, cytokine required for these inhibitory functions of regulatory vessels. 
what we did was that we were interested in determining what is the concentration of this iron in the serum. So for that, normally ELISA has been done. So we want, but ELISA requires a lot of serum or the your, your samples are required a lot because you have to do triplicates on maybe you require 400 or 500, 300 minimum uh, microliters of cytokine for doing one cytokine analysis. But in case of mice, you hardly get one ml or one and a, one point or twelve hundred microliter of blood. From that, only hardly five hundred microliter of blood, uh, serum is there. So that strategy doesn't fit well with case of ELISA for doing serum cytokine analysis. If you are doing ten to fifteen cytokines, no way you can do that in case of mice. So the best strategy is that CBA, that is a cytometric bead array. I think would be also uh, this is one of the major applications of flow cytometry what we use in the lab. So this is basically bead based array. So what uh, the beads are there for each and every cytokine, we have uh, beads. The beads are coated with uh, uh, antibodies for those particular cytokines. For example, this is an iodine cytokine. This will be, uh, this, if the serum is containing the cytokines, this uh, cytokine will be, put in the, if you are taking the iodine bead, then this cytokine will be uh, going and binding to these sites. And then we will use another antibody, to the, uh, which is fluoristically uh, labeled, for example, PE or FITC for this annihilate. And this will be recognized by the flow cytometry in the form of signal. So this is practically or theoretically speaking, you can do 100 of cytokine or uh, analysis with from just 20 microliters of your serum. So what we did, we use the same strategy for determining your IL-10, 17, and TNF-alpha. These two being the anti or the osteoclastogenic cytokines, they were very much increased in case of electronic mice. And the IL-10, because these are significant by both uh, T-Rex and B-Rex. But here we have already shown that how B-Rex are one of the major uh, contributors of Alten in the periphery also. So this is how we again get the similar results that Alten is significantly reduced in case of your these mice because the number of VREX are also been dwindled. Again, we identified and quantified the serum cytokines also with the help of flow cytometry in vivo. And the same thing you can do with the culture supernatums also. We did it. So next, we uh, this finish this story in mice and when we are working, uh, right now we're working on uh, PBMCs, how to define these subsets. And the similar strategy of Buffy coat isolation, PBMC isolation, we are using there, and how we are activating these B cells after isolating these B cells from PBMCs, we are activating them with CPG and CD40L to do these BSEG in the BREG induction and antibody staining and assessing the subsets. So this is how the subset looks like in human PBMCs. The one in the mice and the humans are totally apart. And in the humans case, if you see. We uh, did the same study till CD19, and after that, we used CD24 and 38 because the BREX are basically your 24 high and 38 high B cells among the CD19. So, if you see here, we have these three, four populations. This is the one A, this is basically called as the immature BREX, B cells, which are also the BREX with the uh, 24 high, 38 high phenotype. Memory B cells, this uh, B section is basically your 24 high but 38 negative. Mature B cells are these C1 which are uh, both intermediate, and plasma blast are this D, D portion, which is 19 positive, 24 negative, 38 high. So if you see here, BREX uh, can be induced, uh, these are 2.26%, your, your, sorry, these are the, your uh, immature B cells, which are also your regulatory B cells. This is how we basically define and did a cytokine analysis, even though you find just 2.26% of this A or immature B cells, and B is 4.6, D is 0.64%, but these are the major ones who are producing IL-10. So almost 8% 8, 8 of these IL-10 are secreted by here from the periphery, all, only 2 and 2.04 from other subsets. So these are basically your genuine BREX, which have already been established by others, and also we are also doing the same strategy. So again, how flow cytometry we are using in the lab for identifying and quantification of these BREX in PPMCs. So this is the conclusive slide I would uh, mention here. On uh, in vitro osteoclastogenesis, if you see in vitro osteoclastogenesis, these are BREX are there. So why are IL-10 secretion? They uh, basically inhibit the differentiation of these osteoclast precursors into multinucleated osteoclast with the in the presence of even MCSF and lactam. So this is what the in vitro which we have shown. And in case of mice also, we have again uh, proven these two uh, subsets we have already defined. These are responsible for inhibiting your osteoclastogenesis in case of your uh, mice. So in the future is what we are basically pushing is that maybe we can employ a BREX based cellular therapy also for various inflammatory bone loss conditions, including osteoporosis. So one day we could see this, uh, that osteoporosis could also be on this list of uh, diseases, which could be basically tackled with the help of uh, 
uh, cellular therapy, it could be even BREX therapy or DREX therapy also. So this is our small group and most of the work has been done by student, PhD student, uh, Ms. Lina Sapra. And I thank all of my mentors, students, collaborators, post institutes, funding agencies, and especially the mice who have sacrificed their life uh, so that we can put these data for the uh, mankind. So uh, thank you. And I would be happy to take questions. I am yeah. happy. Yeah, th yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srivastav. I think, uh, you know, it has been uh, an illuminating talk. Uh, and uh, I, I must admit, though, that it has been heavy in content, very heavy. Uh, you okay. have presented a lot of data. And, okay. uh, you know, uh, I'm sure people are going to take a little time to digest that also. Sure, sure. You moved you moved from, you know, various aspects of, uh, uh, you know, first of all, the description of the BREGs, and then also from, you know, their roles in different aspects of uh, osteoporosis. So I think you have covered a, a really broad and deep swath of, of, of work. And congratulations to you for that. Um, we can, you know, and also thank you so much for sticking to time. It's been great to, to listen. And what we can do is while we are waiting for any further questions from the uh, uh, streams, uh, if uh, I can ask you a couple of questions. Um, uh, so first, I'd like you to, you know, just shed some light on, uh, you know, the BRAG as a cell, which is a regulatory uh, 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 cell versus, uh, let's say, a, a T-REG cell, correct? Now, in the yeah. T-REG cell, we have both mechanisms. We have the IL-2 sequestration mechanism through CD25, uh, as well as the IL-10 production, right? So uh, in the BRAG, uh, what I'd like to know is then, you know, BREGs probably don't involve, right, IL-2 sequestration or do they? I mean, so I, I'd like to know how their regulatory activities are different from the T-REGs. So that's a very good question, basically, I would say. Uh, so BREGs are basically, if you if you think what we have done is that you have must have already observed. So T-REGs have a different mechanism. They can either, one of the mechanisms is by sequestering the IL-2 so that the other T-cells, they don't get the IL-2. And they are starved and they are gone, uh, apoptosis is there. Because the, the T rings have a lot of CD25, which take up these IL2. But in case of B rings, the T rings also they secrete IL10 uh, with a various signaling mechanism. They what they do is that they induce tolerance. Okay, they produce an RBA state in case of your uh, other cells. B rings also have the similar strategies. Apart from that, what B rings they have been uh, found to do is that they can regulate T rings also, induction of T rings and inhibition of T17. This has already been reported by various other researchers also. And also we found this also. What we did was that we generated these BREX and we co-cultured these BREX with nine T-cells. And what we found was these BREX were able to induce generation of T-rex and inhibit generation of T17 cells. So you see one another mechanism is also there. So by regulating, upregulating T-rex generation or differentiation and inhibiting T17 uh, your cells, there are again immunomodulatory effect. They are showing how they are promoting your regulatory cells and inhibiting your TS17. So this is one of the mechanism. Plus others, if you see, BREX can uh, basically, which I've talked about via uh, TJ beta also, they can uh, induce tolerance and NRB. So how the membrane TJ beta, how the soluble or the secreted TJ beta, they also induce NRB in various cells. For example, CD8 T cells, they induce NRB. B cells, they also modulate the uh, activity of genetic cells, how they can present the APCs to the T cells. So if they are going to dampen it, they will uh, they will inhibit these functions of the DC so that they don't efficiently present these AP, uh, as an APC to the T cells. Also, these B cells through CD1D, they can induce the generation of NK T cells, which are induced NK T cells. They are regulatory kind of NK T cells. They again take care of your immunomodulation. So they have a number of mechanisms by which, and IL-35 is again a, so some of the BREX they have been also be found to basically secrete granazine B also. So that we have also granazine B positive BREX. We also have TIM, that is your uh, stimulative molecule is there. Then again, that is also again having uh, PDL1 is also, PD1 is also been uh, one of the markers of some of the best subsets of BREX. So we have a vast repertoire of these uh, regulatory molecules which have been employed by BREX to modulate or contain the inflammatory responses in various disease conditions. I think Thank you, yeah. Your... Yeah, I have a question. No. Can I ask a question, Dr. Sure. John? Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. Sure. Sure, Please sir. go ahead. So, Dr. Srivastava, this is, I liked your first slide when you showed a uh, march of uh, immunology, as it were, discovery at different times. 
So yes, when sir. the visa, I started working a little bit in infectious diseases in late 70s, early 80s. And many of these cells that you're describing weren't there. But, and this is just a comment, and maybe a question will follow after the comment. So as I, I remember seeing TNF uh, discovery on the cover of a magazine used to be Life, Life and Time magazine at that time. So that was say, the holy grail of all uh, future problems with the TNF treatment, then TNF, then interleukin network. So suddenly you fast forward to 2000, 2005, 2010, the whole network is so complex that when you make, a, you know, give a lecture to an audience, which is general audience, but scientific audience, I think question back of mind is, so what? B regs with a very small population. If you start digging deep, uh, you may find many more connection to osteoporosis. So my question is this, that osteoporosis, or for that matter, any other function, we may find some correlation. And when T-Rex came, uh, or autophagy was uh, becoming fashion, we see autophagy everywhere. There were no infection, we didn't see autophagy, published papers. T-Rex went the same uh, way. There was everybody agog with T-Rex. Now, if your B regs are there, what role, how much part of role in osteoporosis? Is the minor role, very tiny role? For a basic understanding, as a scientist, great idea. Putting this into any kind of practice, perhaps not because cytokine uh, network itself is so very complex that you can't change the axis or nexus. So I just wonder, uh, as a young, uh, very high quality scientist, how do you reflect onto this? Yes, sir. So basically, I would like to answer this like this. Ki, uh, that slide, I just basically want people to know. Basically, there could be a lot of uh, viewers are there. So I just wanted to let them to know how, how BREC discovery started and how basically B cells and then, up, then uh, slowly coming to your regulatory B cells. Yes, I have skipped some of the important discoveries because it was not... No, that's uh, why I have yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not possible for me to discover, uh, may, may basically take into consideration each and every discovery. But with respect to osteoporosis, I would like to say, he, uh, this is the first basically report how BREX can also be very important in your uh, regulating your osteoporosis, inflammatory bone loss in osteoporosis, because regulatory B cells have already been shown to have similar effects in rheumatoid arthritis, which is also your, your inflammatory bone loss. But in those cases, it is an autoimmune disease. So we have uh, still don't know what the autoantigen is. What we think is basically collagen type 2. So in those cases, we already uh, research from various groups. For example, uh, Claudia Moria group is there in UCL, uh, University College London. They have defined uh, very well how regulatory B cells are important in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So we, when I started my uh, this whole story of immunoborosis, uh, I think four to five years back, because I had a very strong feeling, a, a strong hunch, that osteoporosis is not sim uh, very uh, basically an estrogen loss uh, defined condition. There should be something uh, very important with respect to immunology because as an immunologist, I think each and every condition is linked with the immune system. Only your uh, trauma when there is a physical injury is there, those conditions basically we cannot say they are very directly linked with the immune system, but they also are basically linked with. So I would think is that each and every condition and including osteoporosis is defined by some autoantigens. So I am basically working to define key what that antigen could be there in case of this osteoporosis. No, Mena, let me let me interrupt you here. This is yeah. not my question. Okay. Like what you do is very good, and I think you okay. make a, you already made name for himself, and you'll continue to do so. That's not my question. My question is slightly more reflective questions. Now, understanding of a system is a fundamental to any other discovery. I totally agree. Yeah. The point I was trying to make to the immunologists and to you and to many times myself in malaria or TB, the network is so complex that using the network for any usefulness becomes extremely difficult. And that's why I gave you the example of gum interferon, tumor, ne tumor necrosis factor, and so on. But it was a more of your reflection, not 
that your discovery that we understood very I, yeah 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 i got your question sir that uh, how the cytokine sits. i very much agree with that ki cytokine interface so complex that we cannot really take one cytokine off and just uh, put off the disease so that's basically is very complex and we still have to do a lot of other things also before we can define that so we have Thank to you. we have to judge that basically ki whether for for example osteoporosis in case of osteoporosis maybe it's not a very life threatening condition and we would not go for a cellular therapy in case of osteoporosis but if you similarly think for example if you can modulate this il10 or, or anti il10 therapy and this is very much helpful in case of your depleting of brex if you deplete the brex Uh, or the B cells uh, in case of various other diseases, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. Also, various uh, uh, knockout studies has been done in mice, which we uh, which they have shown that the if you deplete these uh, certain inflammatory B cells, that can be basically very much useful for uh, basically uh, covering up the disease. But those kind of things would not be basically possible in case of osteoporosis right now because the cytokine network is so basically complex that if you modulate one of them. that could also affect other normal physiological functions that i fully agree and that needs a lot of lot of uh, brainstorming and lot of strategies need so, to be defined before so, so dr shrivastav sorry to interrupt sir uh, uh, also i just want to jump in very quickly we've taken more than 6 minutes for this discussion it's wonderful i i just want to ask one quick you know i think it it will fit in very well with this discussion so uh, 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 dr rupesh if i was to ask you Uh, are there any vaccine specific brex that have been identified vaccine specific brex some people have reported that but they were, those are basically not brex specific but some follicular helper t cell mediated something they have done that with case of corona virus yeah. also so, they have seen that yeah yeah so this is this is the point right if you can if you can demonstrate that they are targets yeah. either for vaccine yeah, you know, yeah. generation or some kind of e efficacy improvement or things like that i think it would go a long way towards uh, highlighting them even further as as very important uh, you know subsets to be considered uh, yes, yes. Sir, is it okay if we would you like to continue further sir or should we go on to a question we have a question in the chat box also i am finished thank you all right thank you sir thank you sir okay so uh, <clears throat> we have one more question dr rupesh uh, it's it's um, whether the effect of brex on osteoclastogenesis uh is independent i think you've kind of answered this uh, to the effect of th17 differentiation yeah basically this is what we have done is that we have even covalcured these brex with naive t cells and with th17 cells also i don't i have not shown the data complete data here because of the time constraints and what we have found that these uh, brex have the capacity to inhibit differentiation of th17 cells and activate the secretion of il17 il17 from them because il17 is a well known inducer of osteoclastogenesis So if you covalcure these B reg, so these B reg, that's why I mentioned there very clearly. We have this B reg, T reg, and T S seventeen cell axis. Okay, so B regs, what I think are uh, in the hierarchy above the T regs, where they can even modulate the activity of T reg and T S seventeen cell. That's why I have mentioned that this B reg, T reg, T S seventeen cell axis is very much important uh, in osteoporosis also. Yeah. So uh, it's there's another follow up question. Thank you. And this is uh, you know. as you probably mentioned you know uh, that uh, osteoporosis and uh, you know uh, estrogen uh, may or may not be linked right so this question actually speaks to that uh, and in and you know as you mentioned brex suppress rank l induced osteoclastogenesis so how does it affect osteoporosis in the condition in which bone uh, so in which bone densities are less for example right so is there something that you can comment there with you know osteoclastogenesis in the context of lower bone uh, density so lower bone density is one of the prime factors of uh, prognosis uh, so diagnostic markers for basically if you see that low bmd is basically linked with osteoporosis it is also linked with various other bone inflammatory conditions but but if you go to the clinics and if you are having osteoporosis the first thing what the clinician will do is that we they will recommend a bmd scan and a t score of less than or more than or minus 2.5 will be considered basically your osteoporotic conditions so this is what we are also doing in case of your clinical samples we are also recruiting patients right now we are having a project where we are basically seeing a uh, modulation in this brex population with respect to this bmd or your osteoporotic conditions so this is very much related because bone loss is being governed directly by osteoclasts osteoclastogen enhanced osteoclastogenesis or the dysregulated bone remodeling cycle where the osteoclastogenesis is increased and your osteoblastogenesis that is if you say like a more simple way 
if the bone formation is less and the bone loss is more due to the osteoclast in that case the bmd the net result will be low, um, enhanced bone loss and enhanced yeah. bone loss will be reflected in your lower bone mineral density or bone mineral content in your bones so this is uh, the micro ct uh, uh, the figure which i have shown in case of your mice that also represents the same thing the lower bmd lower bone mineral content the more most of the histomorphometric parameters which we also have we haven't shown there but they are available in my paper so yes they are directly linked and we have also seen that the peripheral bric population are very much down in case of your osteoporotic uh, uh, patients and these brics we are also looking whether they are functional or not so we are also doing lot of uh, experiments to prove that yes they are basically okay. having a compromised functional activity in case of your osteoporotic patient with respect to your normal control patients your your friend dimpu wants to ask you a question hi rupesh excellent work excellent work i i was just wondering you have mentioned like uh, brex are also expressing pdl1 right uh, immune checkpoint yeah, yeah. pd pd is also there so uh, i was wondering i mean uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, osteoporosis or in uh, uh, disease related to bone so how does i mean this immune checkpoint inhibitors are playing a role is it i mean do you think it's playing a major role in inhibiting the uh, i think there should be a major role uh, mm -hmm. still we haven't uh, looked into those angles yes mm -hmm. that is in the back of my mind and uh, one of my students basically uh, only lena is there who is working on this brex projects so we are mm -hmm. also thinking to write more projects and to how we can basically uh, more establish this at a more molecular level he, uh, what are the checkpoints basically for example this pdl1 is there in one subset mm -hmm. of these brex have been reported so how mm -hmm. are they basically can they basically induce the apoptosis of these osteoclasts through pdl1 which we basically don't know but this is possible very much possible because osteoclasts are basically macrophages they are monocytes they are converted into uh, so these macrophages they can could also be regulated by these b regs b cells similar to other immune reactions so there is very much possibility that yes those kind of immune checkpoints and uh, molecules are involved here also in both osteoclastogenesis and osteoblastogenesis that is again a different ball game which we are mm -hmm. working on we have just covered only 50% of the story how osteoclast osteoblast are still open up and we mm -hmm. are similarly great results in those also so we are slowly because of the we are a very small group but we are actively working on that limited uh, working hands are there but if we uh, that's why i am yeah. saying that only two or three groups are working in osteology in india and the world mm -hmm. also very few people are doing that but if mm -hmm. all work force is there we can basically uh, dissect those things in a matter of very uh, not much time will be required okay. for those yeah so so th thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, there's one last question before we wrap up i know we've gone over but uh, it's been such an interesting discussion so uh, just to make sure everyone gets a chance to present their question to you sure, sure. Uh, also uh, dr shrivastav i would encourage you to go through the chat uh, i'm sure in case there are any other specific questions you want to answer please go ahead and type the, the replies uh, we just don't have time to cover every single but uh, here's one last question and that is uh, pertaining to the crosstalk of uh, you know uh, let's say il6 and il21 uh, for you know which which we know is important for b cell memory class switching uh, and then the the crosstalk of that with brex so uh, is there anything that has demonstrated a role for brex in modulating uh, b cell memory so i really don't have that kind of idea how b cell memory would be required be related with these prex but yeah there could be there could be something and we basically can be looked into and to search the literature for that I, right now i don't have any idea but there yeah. should be some link should be there in memory also what we are basically because uh, i would say just relate uh, indirectly that uh, two papers have came up recently which basically define the role of memory t cells in osteoporosis okay so memory t cells if they are there memory b cells are also bound to be there and Correct. what i strongly believe i've already said that ki osteoporosis is also an autoimmune disease what i believe and i will prove that also but in some time maybe some time or in a maybe well, my whole career would be devoted to that but i am working on that if memory t cells because immune system is such a thing such in a specific system it is not activated just like that Okay. It has to be. There has to be some antigen. There has to be antigen specificity. Yeah. Okay. So since the, I would just uh, because a lot of viewers are viewing this, so I would just uh, encourage everybody to support bone research because we think 
we don't require bone research right now but i would say each and every one of you would be suffering from osteoporosis or similar conditions in the later age of yours so i encourage i basically urge the government of india and all the under funding agencies to move fund this research because immune system is harbored in bone healthy bone is also related to your healthy immune system so we need a lot of research in this bone health as an overall so that we can also secure our life later on also and more funding is also in this field because a lot of lot of questions are there right. so you see the amount so, of interest but you don't have those working and uh, right, post right. there those yeah. Uh, okay yeah, yeah, yeah that it. is there very well put thank you very well put i think uh, uh, with that i'd like to close this session and uh, inform the participants that uh, we will resume on time at 1:30 pm we also would greatly value our uh, experts and speakers who have been part of the first session to attend the second session uh, i am going to ask professor chohan about his in, his his thoughts on the malarial vaccine sir you will need to answer that in the evening so i am going to put that as the highlight Uh, for all those who want to to be around till the end um, and uh, uh, we look forward to resuming our streaming both on youtube as well as webex uh, at 1:30 so we will stop our streaming right now and resume at 1:30 pm sharp or maybe uh, you, we will we will try to get there like 5 minutes early so that everyone gets a chance to to log in and stuff uh, enjoy your lunch and and thank you all for a wonderful session looking forward to see you at 1:30 bye thank you thank you all of you